Okay, good morning, everyone. We are uh, live today. We're uh, ready to start our uh, council meeting of Tuesday, June 22nd. So I will call the meeting to order. It is nine o'clock and I'll ask our clerk, Mallory, to do roll call, please. Okay, Councillor Clerk. Present. Councillor Donaldson. Present. Deputy Mayor Kennedy is absent with regrets. Uh, Councillor McKechnie. Present. Councillor Smith. Not present. Councillor Wood Roberts. Present. And Mayor Roberts. Present. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I will ask if there's any disclosure of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof. Seeing none, we'll move along to our adoption of our minutes from our council meeting on May 25th and public meeting of May 25th. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't adopted the agenda. Ha, huh. you'd think I'd know how to do this by now. I need a mover and a seconder to uh, adopt our agenda. Okay, Councillor Wood Roberts, Councillor McKechnie. I knew something seemed wrong. Be it resolved, the agenda for the regular council meeting of the municipality of Dysart et al. held on June 22nd, 2021, be approved as presented. All in favor? That's carried, thank you. And I already asked about disclosure, thank you. And so now for the mover and seconder for the adoption of those minutes. And with Councillor Smith and seconded by seconder, Councillor Wood Roberts. Be it resolved that council approves the following minutes as circulated, the regular council meeting of May 25th, 2021, and the public meeting of May 25th, 2021. All in favor? That's carried, thank you. Uh, today, we um, under mayor and deputy mayor update, obviously, uh, deputy mayor Kennedy is not with us today, so I'll just uh, quickly touch on a couple of things that I wanna update you on one, or, or there's two things happening on the County Council agenda tomorrow that I encourage uh, Dysart councillors to follow if they're able to. Well, one is that we are meeting with Hutchinson Environmental, who is the uh, company that we've hired to do work with us for the Shoreline Bylaw. So we'll be meeting with them tomorrow and they'll be laying out process for how uh, this consultation will go and, uh, and uh, all of that involved with the Shoreline Bylaw. So stay tuned tomorrow. The other thing is we'll begin our uh, discussions about the short-term rental process and how that can um, happen and uh, again, what the process will be for, uh, for short-term rentals and so that the local municipalities will be working together. Um, and lastly, just today's first day of summer. So nice to see the patios open on our main street again this summer and the banners and the flags and the flowers and uh, congratulations uh, to the BIA and Councillor Wood Roberts if you can pass that on. The town looks fabulous. The art installation that's down the main street looks great and things are hopping. Uh, we're not out of the woods with COVID. Obviously we would be meeting in person but we're getting close. Uh, so I encourage everyone to um, you know still stay safe as they say and uh, uh, but we're, we're close and it really is nice to see things coming back to normal a little bit in town. So that's all I have for today. And next we will move into our first uh, delegation and we'll bring him forward, which is, um, um, Barbara's online. Yeah, we have Thomas Turnbull from Grant Thornton LLP to go through our financial audited, uh, audited financial statement. So welcome Thomas. Hi everybody. Hello, um, turn it over to you. I just want to say thanks for having me here today. I know that uh, we, I met, I believe the majority of you last year, but uh, what I'll do is um, I'll be walking through the financial statements today on a high level, and then I'll walk through our uh, report to those charged with uh, governance, that being yourself as council. So I will share my screen. And as always, um, feel free to ask questions as we go, or at the end of the document, we'll wait anyways, and then we'll have like a, a question and answer period. Um, so can I get a thumbs up from anybody who can see those financial statements? Perfect. All right. And I see all the pumped faces for this presentation. So that's a, here we are, the auditors. <laughs> So um, here's your uh, consolidated financial statements uh, for the year ended um, December 31st, 2020. 
So I know in COVID times, six months ago, it seems like an eternity. Let's just be honest. But um, let's take a look back and see uh, what happened during uh, fiscal 2020. I'll touch on your auditor's report inside of the other document. Um, so it's not inside of these uh, financial statements. But uh, as we keep moving to the financial position. So key thing to remember, um, I like pointing out, is that this year is um, really the year of three quarters COVID, right? So as of the end of March, that's really when it hit. Then there was some um, uncertainty around what does that look like? What's this going to impact our financial statements? And how are we going to uh, move forward through this? Okay. So I think you're going to be pleased to see that, um, again, just like uh, many other, other organizations, but I think that there needs to be some, uh, again, a little bit of a pat on the back to uh, your uh, management and to yourselves as counselors for uh, moving through the pandemic. And you'll see here, there uh, hasn't been a significant um, impact in society of your statements. So I think that's a positive. Um, we're seeing a lot of that lately. So it's, uh, again, we're doing, we're doing uh, good as a province. But inside of your financial assets, um, so there's the key things that have changed here. So you have had an increase in cash, cash equivalents. That really, um, there hasn't been too many things that have, um, that have touched that. It's really just where the spending was um, maybe cut back a little bit. There's less capital assets purchased this year. Um, there has been a um, non-cash change in your, um, liability uh, for um, your landfill liability. Sorry, losing my words there, that uh, you'll see below. But the, the majority of it really is just, uh, just again, timing differences from when you're paying your payables and when you're receiving your receivables. At the end of the year, you also did receive some um, safe restart, restart funding that hasn't been spent yet. So that would also increase your cash at the end of the year. If we move down, the, down your financial assets, there really hasn't been too many changes. Your taxes receivable have gone up, but I think that would be part of course in a sense. A lot of people were struggling financially. Um, you try to collect as fast as you can, but again, there would be a slight increase there. I don't think that's, un, that's unusual or what I like to call a red flag where you put a red flag in there and you have to be uh, concerned. Moving on to your liabilities. Um, as, I was, as I was saying, deferred revenue has gone up uh, to $1.4 million versus the approximately one in the last year. The main reason for that is just some safe restart funding that's been received yet to be spent as of December, um, but I'm sure it's spent right after the year end. Landfill liability is, uh, is the interesting one where I think we had some talk last year and you'll see inside of the segmented disclosure note. Last year, there was quite a swing because it went down quite a lot. And this year it's actually gone back up slightly. Um, this is all due to, uh, again, interest rates and uh, where they're falling during the year. And because of the calculation that comes along with that, quite a complex um, present valuing and of uh, what these future costs are gonna be. It's uh, really brought it back up. So there's quite a swing that's inside of your environmental expenses, but we'll see that in a couple minutes. Everything else is uh, pretty consistent from year to year. You have been paying down your debt, again, positive. Um, capital lease obligations been paying down, positive. And uh, as we touch on into your uh, financial or non-financial assets, so your long-term assets with your tangible capital assets, um, really there has been a small decrease, but again, that's just uh, your asset or your additions for the year. Uh, I believe it was around uh, 2.5, just offset by the amortization that you took during the year. So again, it's the old accountants with their accounting entries and just uh, non-cash items that are flowing through your tangible capital assets. So that brings us to the end of the day of an accumulated surplus of $34.4 million. So slightly up from last year, again, a positive sign. When you go into your statement of operations, so really, if we take a look at the revenue, I would say it's very, this is a very good sign. Your, your revenue and your operation, your revenue base in general very consistent from prior year, almost exact, almost $30,000 difference. That's it. I'd say that's really a good sign. There's hardly any change there. So what's happened, what's happened inside of that revenue base is that your taxes, you did increase your taxes 3.65%. 
there was um, um, offsetting that increase there. There was just a small difference in the development charges. And there was a, a larger loss on disposal of tangible capital assets this year. So that was more just of a, that was just more of a cleanup of what was inside your tangible capital assets. There wasn't anything again that I would say red flag, you need to be um, concerned about just more of the cleanup amount. So when we move down to your expenses, you're going to see that there has been an increase that, or an increased amount there. So again, this is where we start touching on this landfill liability and the swings that have uh, taken place. So if you remember in the prior year, and it was a very thrilling presentation where I mentioned there was a $1.7 million swing down in your expenses because of how the landfill liability um, changed. So this year, because it went up, that actually created, an, it creates what appears to be a $900,000 swing in your expenses. However, that's more of just the accounting entry to the get it to, to move year to year. So nothing to be concerned about there. Um, there was also another increase in contracted services that had to do with haulage and processing um, of your waste disposal that's inside environmental. And those are, those are the main drivers for why your expenses have gone up. Um, you'll see that more when we get to the segmented disclosure note. It's environmental. The environmental sec or section is really the key driver here. And you can even see it, sorry, right in the middle here. Um, everything else is pretty consistent from year to year. Um, general government did go up a little bit. But again, I think there's, there's something to say there with just uh, salaries and just keeping everybody, um, keeping everybody employed. We flip over your general surplus, there's, or sorry, your uh, accumulate, or your uh, net debt, which shows your uh, change in, uh, from accumulated surplus and other items. There's really not too much to mention there. Again, as I met, as I said on the prior, prior slot or prior pages, there was $2.5 million in additions and it's offset by your 2.6 in uh, amortization. So again, that shows that where that decrease is coming from, and you did have some loss on uh, disposal of assets this year, and just just uh, impacted your uh, tangible capital assets. Everything else on here, again, very small changes. Uh, you have an overall uh, uh, net debt at the end of the year of uh, nine hundred thirty-one thousand dollars. So that's positive. It's reducing that amount, right? You're reducing that amount from the one point nine million dollars in net debt that was there last year. So again, another positive uh, factor. You go to your statement of cash flows. So as I've already touched on the main uh, differences here, the biggest things on here would be your, uh, again, your acquisition of tangible capital assets for the $2.5 million, your amortization that we've touched on on the other page of 2.6. Everything else is more just uh, um, timing differences that are mainly from your, um, working capital items, but they're all non-cash. Just timing of when you pay your payables, collect your receivables, things like that. So again, nothing that I would put a red flag in. And the positive notes here are, again, con continuing to pay down your debt and continuing to pay down your um, capital lease payments. So there's two items that you usually look at on a cash flow. Um, one being the overall um, change from operations. In this case, it's a positive $3.5 million. Again, positive. And then the second thing that you usually look at is your overall change. So last year it was a small negative, nothing to be too concerned about. But this year, again, showing the management that's happened over the COVID period, you have a positive of $382,000. So I think that's a good thing. So the best part of the statements is all the notes. I think everybody can agree on that. Um, but from what I'll, this is what I'll do for you. Um, what I'll do is I'll comment that the majority of these notes are, um, again, the exact same as last year, just update for me minor wording changes or the operations that have occurred. So what I'll do is I'll just touch on a couple that I know that we've, um, we've altered during the year or that, um, that you may be interested in seeing. So, um, again, small wording changes throughout these uh, these front notes. There isn't anything that, I, again, I would say red flag or things that have changed um, significantly. 
the biggest thing um, that I would, would show you would be in the prior year, I think everybody remembers that we um, moved through this uh, Dysart Facilities Limited Partnership. So there is some no disclosure that still remains this year, but that will drop off next year. It's been changed to indicate that was the prior year. That'll just fall off the statements next year. Um, not too much of a big deal. There hasn't been any um, new additions to this um, note, so that's good. There's not over or significant commitments that you've made going forward. So again, I think that's more of a sign of the times um, with COVID and cash management. And then you can draw assets. Okay, note 17. So this is the one that I think we'll just spend a, a little bit of time on here. We'll just go on to this page. So your segmented information, again, just to break out of your statement of operations, just in the different segments and more split out so you can kind of see where um, changes do occur. So the biggest one here, again, it's your environmental services is where the larger, the larger changes are. And it's all has to do with this one item right here, contracted services. So that's where your change in landfill liability is recorded. And that's where also, as I mentioned um, previously, that haulage and processing um, of the waste disposal, the additional amount of $452,000 increased from the prior, that's where that's recorded. So that'll be your biggest change in expenses from year to year. Um, again, everything else is fairly consistent, which is again, a great um, thing to note. On the revenue side, as I mentioned um, earlier, really from the increase in your tax, um, your tax rate uh, during the year, that's uh, uh, driven your taxation base up. However, um, again, there's a small offset here with uh, just the cleanup of capital assets. There's a loss that uh, appears here. And really there's just some development uh, contributions in the prior year that you just don't have this year. So again, overall, you have an annual surplus of $605,000, which as you can, as you note, we go back to the other, other uh, year here, if I just look to 2019, last year was quite a lot larger just because of the swing in that um, landfill liability. Okay. So if I keep going, good old COVID uh, comes into play. So last year, we, I believe we still had this uh, uh, COVID subsequent event note. This year, it's just an impact note. So again, just like the prior year, it's very unfortunate. And I think if we even touch on what the mayor just said uh, prior to me talking, although things are moving in a positive direction, we still don't really know what's gonna happen in the next year, right? Who knows where it's gonna be? I would love to be in person. Let's see if we can get there. <laughs> so, uh, really what this COVID note is indicating is that COVID is still uh, prevalent. COVID is happening. We just don't know what's going to happen here, right? There could be some unforeseen changes to the environment again, and who knows if that'll have an impact on the statements. But again, from what we, do, what we know this year, <clears throat> the pandemic has had a minimal effect on the municipal operations, other than um, now things are done more remotely. There's been changes in services and how they're provided and uh, things like that. And I, I think that's it. The, the, the last uh, thing on here is just the trust funds. I'm not sure if I went through those last year. Probably not. Um, I'm, I can't recall, maybe Barbara might, but you can go touch on yeah, those. We'll open it up for questions, great. Yeah, just very brief. Really, this just like outlines your trust funds and uh, what, what's inside of there. Um, really, this has to do with the, uh, the cemetery. But again, nothing crazy in there. There's a small amount of interest that's earned yearly in transfers. So I will stop sharing just for one second so I can see everybody's face if there's any questions um, regarding the statements. Okay, so I will open it up to the floor for uh, counselors to um, have questions. But I also, uh, first of all, I wanna thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for your report. You, um, you like to say financial statements, woohoo, but they're, they're very important. And, uh, you know, it, it sometimes for, for us counselors, uh, you know, some of the numbers are, we, we, we put our faith in a company like yours to, uh, to uh, provide these statements and we, we appreciate that very, very much. 
I also want to thank Barbara for her efforts uh, because it takes a lot of work getting all that information together and back and forth and it's a little more challenging doing it all remotely. So thank you, Barbara, and your team for all of that. Um, I appreciate that you said no red flags. That's, that's great to hear. And also the impact of COVID-19, we still don't fully know that. So I was glad to sort of see that in as a note. Um, and it sounds like overall, we're, we're doing a fairly responsible uh, job of being stewards of the municipal funds and taxation and providing services, uh, paying down debt uh, and, and continuing to operate. So let's open it up to the floor. Or Barbara, did you want to say anything first and before I see if councillors want to speak? I just, I just want to mention, I do have to go through that other report, but I just thought I'd pause here just to see the yes. things on the theme. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I really don't have any comment. I think uh, Thomas has given a very good overview of the uh, financial results for 2020. So are there any questions at this point or should we continue? Uh, Councillor Smith and then Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you, Thomas. Uh, um, maybe I could ask a couple of questions initially, uh, Thomas. Uh, first, uh, um, you know, there's no uh, uh, no letter here yet, but I guess based on your comments of no red flags, that eventually there will be a, uh, uh, you know, call a clean audit letter. Uh, but from your work, uh, both with us and other uh, municipalities, uh, could you identify anything that uh, uh, you, strikes you as particularly positive about Dysart, things that we're doing really well? And, um, and at the same time, are there things that uh, you would recommend that we focus uh, a little more attention on, if you like, in terms of uh, trying to uh, improve? So if, if I was gonna, the one thing that I was actually thinking about just before you, you even said that question was I think that the ability of Dysart to adapt to the COVID situation was quite impressive. Like you were able to, switch gears and like that's been the key of the year is how how has an organization been able to change what they're doing to fit the new environment and i will i will say that uh, for a municipality especially because you're a larger organization that you've done quite a good job at switching gears getting things more virtual offering programs be it not in person and really continuing on the operations like, I think that's the main thing that I point out to you is that it's been, you've done a good, very good job. Management's done a very good job at that. And you can just look around and see that not everybody's in the same boat, right? It's a, it's a hard, um, change is hard for everybody, right? But you've done an especially good job at actually just making that change. A lot of people struggled and it took, it took a long time. I'm sure there was challenges for you. But uh, from the outside in, it appears that uh, it was very successful for you. <laughs> so that's what I would, that's the message I would say that you need to know. I, again, no red flags that I would like to point out, but it's just more of a, I think you did a really good job this year in adapting, so. Well, uh, thank you for that. I, our, uh, our staff would deserve uh, the credit for that. And, uh, and so uh, good that uh, some of them heard that comment from you. Um, in terms of the of the numbers, uh, to get a number of questions, but you know, at this point, uh, um, one thing uh, last month we had an asset management plan uh, presented at council, and um, uh, and it showed nearly two hundred million dollars in assets. Um, you show in your financial statements uh, non financial assets of about thirty five million. Our numbers yeah. for both of those. Um, I could offer some conjecture as to uh, you know. The gap, the reasons for the gap between 35 million and 200 million, uh, but um, uh, best to have hear it from you in terms of uh, whatever explanation you or or Barbara for that matter may uh, offer to explain to uh, to those who uh, watch our council meetings and will remember the 200 million and say, "Gee, it's, the financial statements only show 35 million. What's going on?" I can offer some insight into that. I'm not sure exactly where the 200 million is coming from, but. Um, the number that you see inside of your statements of the 35, that is net of accumulated amortization. So right off the bat, your asset cost would be cut from what I'm seeing here. So you have a total cost of 82 million. There's $47 million in um, amortization that's been accumulated. And then to get to your 35, 
the 200, I'm not, I'd have to leave that up to Manjin to let you know where that came from. But um, yeah, that's pretty much where, what the difference would be on the statements. Yeah, Barbara's ready to chime in on there. Go ahead, Barbara. Yes, so for further clarification in terms of the number quoted in the asset management plan, that is the replacement value of the assets. If we were to replace them uh, today, as an example, the value of the assets in the um, audited financial statements are the actual cost value of the assets when they were acquired. So the cost value uh, stated in the uh, audited financial statements is actually just under $83 million. Of that, 48,000 has been amortized. So the net uh, value of the asset is 35 million on the um, audited financial statements. So in a nutshell, audited financial statements, you're looking at your actual cost. Uh, asset management plan is the cost to replace the assets today. Thanks, that was good clarification. Um, Councillor uh, Clark had his, his waiting in the wings and then Councillor McKechnie. Yeah. yeah, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, Tom, you've answered through, through Councillor Smith, you've answered some of my questions, but the uh, uh, 2020 was a very different year for delivery of municipal services. <laughs> you probably know better than the rest of us. Um, what we've seen is, is areas where we've had to limit services because of, of uh, you know, COVID restrictions and also um, some challenges in terms of like, you know, groups like the Rose Department. They could no longer have two or three people in a truck anymore. They had to each take an individual truck, which all drove impact both their ability to, to deliver services and also the cost of delivering those services. Um, some of that is starting to come back into normal. Um, we're seeing some very high costs in terms of building materials and that type of thing. Um, any Anything, any um, advice you can give us in terms of areas to watch for that are going to be more expensive in terms of delivery based on what you're seeing in other areas? Or has there been any kind of analysis in terms of what's going to, what, you know, what's going to impact our budgets in, in, um, you know, for the balance of 2021-2022? Uh, so I think the message for 2020 was control your discretionary spending. That was everywhere. Like control your discretionary spending was the message to all organizations. So the thing that I would say is like, as things start to like move back or I wouldn't even go, I wouldn't even go or say fully back. There's changes that you've made that probably will stick around. And I know that's like, some people don't want to hear that, but it is the truth of the matter. Virtual meetings, it's not gone forever. Although we may have per some or some in-person meetings, I would bet that half the meetings are still, still some sort of virtual meeting. So what I would say to you is that there's been changes that have been made, discretionary spending has been um, looked at and controlled. So as you start to shift back to some maybe uh, more in-person ways of doing things, you have to still monitor those discretionary spends. And the reason is because now you've moved to a new model and you're saying, okay, this is how I can be successful doing this. But once you move back to in-person, there will be some additional costs, right? There'll be more people time, that you'll need travel time, things like that. So it's, again, important that you, you monitor those things like going forward. In terms of things that are gonna cost you more, from what we're hearing is that um, supplies. Supplies of um, equipment and things that are uh, coming from overseas, that's where the costs are gonna um, increase this year. There's a lot of problems where, um, because of COVID, and as you see, like lumber is like a key, a key example, right? With, uh, with demand and really with the shutdown of um, the shutdown of plants and things like that, people haven't had time to manufacture things. So the cost of um, items are going, are going up and the, the delivery times of items to places is taking longer. So it's, again, something that you need to monitor um, supplies of and where you're getting um, your items from, but it's just more something that, again, as you move through the year, it's just changing back, right? And getting back into the and getting back into like how things are going to um, be in the new world, where it's probably like a 50 50, I'd say, on in person uh, virtual. So. Okay, thank, thank you for that. I, I have to say, since the time I've been on Dysart uh, Council, we've always tried to control any discretionary spending. It's been a key motto here is uh, check and double check, and we, we don't 
So even though that is a, a, a theme going forward, but it's always been our theme, I think, um, not to be cheap, but to be careful, it's public funds. So uh, Councilor McKechnie had a question, and then I think we'll move on. You had another report. No, I, I don't have a question. I just want to second what you said earlier in regard to uh, Barbara and her team. What a great job, Barbara. You should be so proud. And I know I am, and I'm sure the rest of the council is also, and all the taxpayers and municipality of Dysart should be very happy. And uh, we're lucky to have you looking after all our money. Um, also, Mr. Uh, Thomas there, uh, I'd, I'd like to say thank you for all the positives you said about our, our council and our financial statements. There was no negatives at all and uh, no red flags. I just think it's a real compliment to you, Barbara, and your team. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKechnie. Um, and so, Thomas, you had another uh, report. Yeah, so I'll just uh, I'll just go through this uh, the report on um, really how we performed our audit, what that was kind of looking like, and some of the results there. But I think there we go. Can everybody see this? So. Um, again, I'll do very high level on this because I know you've seen this report in the prior years and I know everybody read it last night because it was so, so good. Right. Um, so this is our report to those charged with governance. Um, we are required to, again, communicate with those charged with governance on our audit, on the results of that audit and anything significant that we need to bring to your attention. So after today. In theory, the statements are approved. We'll get a management letter uh, signed by uh, your management team. Um, we have received your legal letters back already, so there's nothing that um, needs to be noted there. There'll be some small updates to the procedures for subsequent events that we've already done. Um, with, with our audit, really, I, th I mentioned this last year, is we used a risk-based approach. It'd be highly cost or cost ineffective and for us to audit every single transaction that went through a municipality, we'd be here forever. And then you'd see me in uh, 2025 when I finished the 2020 audit. So what we do is we take a look at and we take a look at your statements. We look for where are the risks in your statements. We focus more time on those risks, but meanwhile we still use our um, sampling approach and our other analytical approach to um, audit the remainder of your statements and come together with uh, the final result. The first risk that um, you'll see in the prior years, but again, um, as I mentioned, is here, still here, is COVID-19. Just something that we keep in mind going forward. There is uncertainty around that, but we've taken a look through your statements. There hasn't been anything, again, red flag that we need to bring up. Um, just more of a consideration while we did our audit, while we did the audit. With the significant risks of your, um, of your statements, so I think it's important to remember that the first two here, um, fraud risk and revenue recognition and fraud risk and management override, those things are common with all organizations, okay? It's something that all organizations have and it's something that we do um, take a look at inside the audit. Although our audit is not uh, mainly um, there to detect or prevent fraud, it's just something we consider while we do it. And that's what creates these uh, riskier areas where we do additional work. Right? We look at your journal entries, we look at the um, revenue recognition, and uh, really we do more um, testing around these things. So we have found nothing that we need to bring to your attention. With the landfill liability, because of the complexity of that estimate, it is something that, again, creates a little bit of a risk. So we do spend some more time there. Um, the only finding that we have there is just the journal entry that needed to be recorded to update your landfill liability amount. So again, that's a, what I would say is a usual thing because it happens every single year. Nothing that I need to bring to your attention, just that there was an entry that you'll see on a subsequent page here that um, relates to this. Oops, sorry. Um, the other, the other, other, other areas of risks are just your accounts payable. Um, just do the timing and making sure everything has been recorded in your books, which there's no exceptions that we had. Um, your employee future benefits, again, who knew there was an even more um, complex account called an actuary, right? So beyond auditor is the actuary and they're doing your, um, they're taking a look at your employee future benefits. And what we do is we um, 
talk to the actuary. We take a look at what you've submitted to the actuary and just make sure that it's reasonable and there's nothing that we need to bring to your attention there. Um, fraud and legal acts, again, something we consider during the audit. Um, there's nothing that we have found, nothing that we need to bring to your attention. As far as um, adjustments and unrecorded misstatements, so with these adjustments, there were, um, sorry, there were five or five adjustments that are on here. There's nothing again that I, I need to bring your attention here. The more routine entries, um, landfill liability, really just some internal um, internal reserve items that um, we've just adjusted out, which is fine. That was the same as the prior year and just where your principal payments have been recorded and then two other small entries. So nothing of a uh, significance there. With the unrecorded misstatements, so there was one in, or there was one related just to, uh, again, the cleanup of all those capital assets and where that loss was. There's just a small amount that when you cleaned up, it was realized it, there are some uh, amounts related into the prior year. Um, there's no disclosure matters that we need to bring to your attention. So that's positive. We do have an internal control letter, but you're going to see that in a, in a couple um, pages here. Again, similar comment to the prior year. So again, nothing I would say red flag, just more of something to keep in mind as those charged with governance. Um, we are your independent auditors. There's nothing I need to bring your attention that would impair our independence. Oops. There are a couple um, accounting standards that are coming up, but a positive of COVID is that because of COVID, they've decided to push those back even further. So again, um, there are some changes. The biggest ones would be in the revenue standard and the financial instrument standard. But as we, as we approach 2023, um, when these things start to come in, um, again, Grant Thorn will help you uh, move through that process and adopt these standards without there being um, too much of a too much of a, a speed bump there. Um, with our Appendix A, we do have an overview and approach um, of the audit. So that really, we're just explaining everybody's roles and responsibilities. I think everybody is aware of what those are, and again, you're performing your role um, admirably. With the five uh, phases of our audit, really right now we're in the concluding and reporting. We've completed all the testing, all of our planning, and really we're just wrapping up um, the audit um, process. As I mentioned earlier, it would be quite um, unrealistic to audit everything inside of your books. That's where you use the materiality level. Um, when we do look inside of your um, statements and it helps us gauge where we need to look at and what kind of scope we're using to um, look at some of your invoices and other transactions that have happened during the year. Uh, just again, just accounts payable being um, just a little risk area that we take a look at, aside from a significant risk. So here's your uh, auditor's opinion. Um, just like Councillor Smith there, or Smith had indicated, um, you do have, again, a clean opinion on your audit. Um, once you do approve the statements today, this will be finalized, today's date on it. Um, there's nothing that I need to report to you here. Um, that's out of the ordinary. And again, it was a good clean audit. So. Um, draft major representation letter. I won't go through this because this is just, uh, again, a standard templated letter. I don't think it's very interesting to uh, go through there. And the last thing here is your internal control letter. So I think you'll notice that um, the difference, the, the difference between last year and this year was last year, um, Barb's ability to post and was posting journal entries um, during the year versus in the 2020 year, um, Barb has stopped doing that. The process has changed where she no longer posts entries. However, she just still has the ability to do that. So there's a big, di there's, there's two things there. There's monitoring controls around the process now where Barb no longer um, post entries, and that's something that we do check to make sure that she's not doing it. However, the ability is still there, but there are um, appropriate monitoring controls in place now to make sure that that doesn't happen. But just something to keep it keep in mind, because segregation of duties, again, as um, uh, those charged with governance board, it's it's very it's uh, something that you got to keep in mind when you're just receiving reports and things like that. That um, if there is a segregation of duties problem, just again. 
ask questions. You already are asking questions. You've asked some really good questions today. Just keep asking those questions. Have a questioning mind. Um, yeah, don't take anything at face value, but I say that about everything. <laughs> so. And the last thing here is just the accounting developments, which I won't go in, into in any great detail, but the revenue and the uh, financial instrument standards that are in here, those are the biggest things. The financial instrument one is the one that you'll need the most help with, and we'll make sure that we're there to assist you with that um, transition. So I will leave it at that. Um, yeah, if there's okay. any questions with what I've just presented, please let me know. Is there any questions on, on that report? I think we had lots of good questions asked earlier. So thank you once again, and, and thank you to Barbara. And I do have a resolution to accept the 2020 audited financial statements. Would I have a mover and a seconder for those? Uh, Councillor Donaldson and Councillor McKechnie. We resolve that council accept the 2020 audited financial statements from Grant Thornton as presented. All in favor. And that's carried. Thank you very much for presenting today and uh, same time next year. We'll see ya. <laughs> Same guy next year. Okay. <laughs> All right. Have a, have a good day, everybody. You as well. Okay, so we do have a public meeting today. So this is the part where we close our council meeting. So I need a mover and a seconder to adjourn our regular meeting of council. Uh, Councillor Wood Roberts and Councillor Donaldson. Be it resolved that council hereby adjourns the regular meeting of council at 9.41 a.m. to proceed into a public meeting to consider the following a zoning bylaw amendment, file number ZA 2021-005, Lanza Coagma Shores Family Trust. All in favor? Okay, and that's carried. So we are now in the public meeting. Uh, and I just have a little preamble to read regarding that. I did check with uh, Chris Orson and we do not have anybody registered, but there are still people listening in. There's nobody registered to speak. Uh, so good morning. The purpose of a public meeting is to present a planning applications in a planning form as required under the Planning Act. This is a public meeting to consider one proposed zoning amendment to the Dysart et al. zoning bylaw 2005-120. During the public meeting, council will consider all information available regarding the proposed amendment review the staff report, which includes any public comments received to date, and listen to all comments provided during the meeting. Uh, this meeting and future public meetings will be hosted by electronic participation format only until further notice. Any oral or written submissions received in advance of the meeting will be verbally read aloud at the time that the application is considered. Um, I don't believe there are any people registered, so I will continue on um, with the, the one last comment here. The Planning Act specifies that if a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the municipality of Geisert at all before the proposed bylaw is passed, the person or persons or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the municip municipality to the local appeal tribunal and may not be added as a party to an appeal unless in the opinion of the tribunal there are reasonable grounds to do so. So now I will turn it over to Chris Orson to go through our file, so one file today. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mayor Roberts and good morning, uh, members of council. Um, this file is uh, for zoning bylaw amendment 2021-005 for the lands of Coagama Shores Family Trust. Um, as council may remember, due to COVID, the proper circulation uh, as per the Planning Act requirements were not met and therefore the application was deferred at the May Council meeting to allow for proper circulation uh, to be completed. As such, the circulation requirements have now been met and to date there have been no public comments received for this application. Uh, the brief outline uh, for the proposed is the applicant would like to rezone their property located at 5337 Quagama Lake Road from waterfront residential type 5L-2 exception zone to waterfront residential type 5L-4 exception zone in order to permit a boathouse within the required setback from a water body, which is Quagama Lake. 
uh, through section 15.2.1, uh, the special policy area of Quagamaw Lake, and despite policies of section 5.1.2, uh, boathouses may be permitted in the special policy area adjacent to Quagamaw Lake. Boathouses will be limited to a single story structure that, uh, that do not include living quarters. Furthermore, the proposed um, is also subject to a site plan, um, sorry, a site plan and, and agreement. The owner is to submit uh, the site plan application. Uh, full ownership of the applic uh, by the applicant of the subject lands, um, which may require the purchase of the shoreline uh, road allowance, which um, council may remember in May, they approved uh, that application that's come through. And if there's any approvals required through the Ministry of Natural Resources and uh, the Canada, Canada Department of Fisheries and Ocean, if required. Uh, therefore, as per section 5.2.1 of the official plan, the property is also subject to the site plan agreement as mentioned as part of the application to ensure the property is developed in accordance with the municipal zoning bylaw and technical recommendations uh, as per the environmental impact study as submitted in support of the proposed application. In addition, as part of the process, the shoreline um, road closing application was required. And as mentioned, um, council did approve that at their May 2021 meeting. Uh, just a brief description of the property. The property is a waterfront residential lot on a plan of uh, subdivision plan 19M2, lot 13, with frontage on Quagamaw Lake and access through a private road known as Quagamaw Lake Road. The subject property is well vegetated with steep slopes from the lake. There are no water courses or wetland communities identified by the supporting EIS on the subject lands. Existing development of the property contain a single family dwelling with attached garage, gravel driveway, stone walkway, um, and a dock. The applicant is also proposing the development of the boathouse, which is part of this, app which is this application and which is um, permitted through the section 15.1 of the special policy area for Quagamaw Lake. In addition, staff had conducted a site plan or a site visit on May 28th and noted that a boat port was constructed over a marine facility, the dock um, related to the property, which is not permitted by the municipal zoning bylaw. Therefore, the structure is required to be removed. The owner has confirmed the boat port structure will be removed and that the owner will provide photos once completed. Uh, it is staff's opinion that the proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms with the official plan, uh, is appropriate and represents good planning, and therefore staff recommend that council approve the zoning bylaw application. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, so I see a question from Councillor Clark first. Go ahead, and then Councillor Smith second. Yes, yeah, through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, two questions, Chris. Um, I guess the first, mostly across DICEARP, we have not been encouraging boat houses and that we've been trying to uh, maintain natural vistas, natural views of our shorelines and encourage you know, <laughs> um, a, a greener space. Um, however, I do recognize that Quagama is, is primarily accessed through Algonquin Highlands who do have different standards. Um, in your site visit, are there other boathouses in that area or is this going to be kind of a first non-conforming or standout? I may defer that um, that first question that Jeff, or sorry, that just about uh, adjacent boat houses. This is Jeff did conduct the uh, the, the site visit on my behalf, um, and that is correct. That through our official plan, um, these this is a special policy area which does permit um, boat houses as long as they go through the proper um, processes, which is what this applicant is doing. So I'll refer that over to Jeff now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, staff uh, uh, conducted a site visit of an island property as well as the subject lands. Um, we only visited the subject lands in Dysart, um, which um, is proposing a boathouse. But when we went to the island, we actually met um, at a property located in Algonquin Highlands. And, and Councillor McKechnie was there with me and can confirm this. But a lot of those properties in that area where we met did have boathouses along the shoreline. Um, second question, um, what is the frontage on the property, Chris? What I'm, what I'm trying to determine is how much hard build is on that shoreline and is this boathouse going to you know, increase that percentage of non-natural shoreline? Uh, 
I'd have to look at the survey. Um, it may even be in the, the report, which I'd have to, I can open up that as well if, if I yes. have yes. a second. And yeah. while Chris is looking, I can speak to that because I was on site again and the, the shoreline is very well vegetated and, and the, um, there is steep slopes or, or topography, I should say, um, at the shoreline. So the proposed location of the boathouse isn't going to be right down on the water. It is actually going to be set back a bit up some steps um, from the water, but it is where it's very well vegetated there along that shoreline and the proposed okay. location should be well screened. Uh, Jeff, do you know what, what their frontage is, what the waterfront frontage is, the number of feet? It's in the report, 306.6 uh, okay. feet. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And it is a dry land boathouse. Okay. So, yep. you know, okay. So, so the overall build on the shoreline then is, is it's not going to be a very high percentage, is what I'm, my, my point is. Yeah, That's subject correct. To, subject to the condition to remove uh, the structure located on the dock. Okay, That's you. correct. And, and, and further to that note, uh, they are subject to site plan control, which will implement the um, technical recommendations out of the um, environmental um, study, as well as to ensure that um, the development does meet our policies to protect the shoreline integrity for visuals and, and, and those things. So just additional note. Okay, was there another question? I'm sorry. Uh, Councillor Smith, yes, right. Uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, to follow up uh, on uh, Councillor Clark, I, I did speak with the uh, the head of the uh, Coagama Lake uh, Cottage Association, and, uh, and they had no concerns about this uh, uh, application. Um, but I, I had a question for uh, Chris or Jeff. I'm not sure. Uh, um, you know, as uh, as has been highlighted, uh, uh, Coagam is kind of unique in the regard of uh, permitting uh, boathouses from a Dysart point of view. Um, you know, there was a lot of discussion uh, last uh, fall and winter, and uh, as uh, the mayor has indicated, there's a report tomorrow at uh, County Council regarding uh, uh, the shoreline protection bylaw. But I don't recall in any of the meetings so far at a county level, any discussion of the uh, potential impact on boathouse approvals uh, as a result of the, uh, you know, the, the draft uh, shoreline protection uh, uh, bylaw. And as, so can you report on any discussions that you're aware of at the county level? Would, would it affect uh, these uh, going forward or uh, would you expect these to continue to be permitted um, under the terms of the shoreline protection bylaw, at least as it's been discussed so far? Sorry, Councillor Smith, is your question directed to Jeff Miles or to me? Well, I, I thought that, uh, you know, our staff, I'd be happy to have you offer perspective, but I thought the staff would have been involved in discussions with the county staff, uh, you know, when that draft was being developed. And so, but hey, I can get a perspective from anybody who uh, has some uh, background on it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we, uh, we've had limited discussions with the county staff on this. I did review the agenda for tomorrow, and, and I do see uh, part of the um, outline for the project is to consult with uh, our staff as well. So there hasn't been any discussions on boathouses. Um, as you know, it, it's different in each municipality what they permit um, with regards to structures within the minimum setback area. Um, I did review um, the existing um, tree preservation bylaw and the proposed shoreline preservation bylaw. And my understanding of it is that if it's approved by the zoning bylaw, then it will be continued, um, it'll be allowed to continue to uh, exist in that location without permits. So don't hold me to that. I, I have reviewed it, but I think anything that's permitted in the bylaw is still okay to proceed. Um, and keep in mind that the bylaw that uh, Jeff is just referring to will likely over go over a very large overhaul when public consultation takes place. For instance, one of the comments coming out of that was, well, you didn't even talk about uh, fertilizer. You didn't talk about revitalizing properties that are already existing. They're only triggered by, um, by uh, not a building permit or a landscape permit, that type of thing. So, um, uh, and, and it does go to percentages. So I would imagine that things that are permitted, like Jeff just said, under a zoning bylaw would still be permitted. So, um, but, but uh, and also as Jeff referred to, and in, in, in it says in the report that not only will uh, planning staff be 
in, involved in the communication and the process, counselors will be as well. So we'll be able to have input on that. Anyway, if there's no further questions on this particular file, I do have a mover and a seconder and there were no public comments and there was no written comments and there's no one registered. So would I have a mover and a seconder to um, direct that to Councillor Smith and Councillor McKechnie? Here it result that the report for the lands of Coagama Shores Family Trust, which consists of Plan 19M2, Lot 13, Geographic Township of Havelock, Municipality of Dysart et al. be received for information and the council directs a bylaw be brought forward for consideration during its June 22nd, 2021 regular meeting. And the council recommends approval of the proposed bylaw 2021-41. All in favor? Okay, so that carries. And that concludes our public meeting. So I do need a mover and a seconder to adjourn the public meeting. Councillor Donaldson, thank you. And seconded by Councillor Smith. It resolved the council hereby adjourns the public meeting at 9.56 a.m. and reconvenes the regular meeting of council. All in favor? Okay. That's carried. And we are back into our regular meeting. And let me just get my place in the agenda. Which is on to delegations. Um, we've moved things around a little bit, the planning will come, sometimes planning came right after this, but we've moved things around to have these delegations. And the first delegation we're going to bring forward, uh, Mike Darlington, and I believe Tom Lambert, and Adam Brady, there's Mike. And I'll wait till I've got everybody on screen to start. Chicken here is Adam Brady. And I believe Tom Lambert is also joining us. Okay, so uh, welcome, gentlemen. And uh, Mike Darlington is with the Halbert Highland North Trails, as well as Tom Lambert is the president of the Halbert Highland North Trails, and Adam Brady is a a cross country skier and an architect, uh, and they've been working with them. Myself and Deputy Mayor Kennedy have been working uh, together with this group along with staff, uh, Jeff Lyles and Carl uh, and Rob, to work together to find um, the location to, uh, and, and to fulfill our commitment to the ski club to, uh, to work with them to build a garage. Their desire is to build a garage and warming center. So um, my report's in there. I'm not reading, going to read from my report because that was included in your agenda package, but the, uh, the, this has been a joint project and it, it really is following the commitment all stemming from our agreement with the college uh, and in order to gift the college land and to build a student residence, the garage was in the direct path of where the best location was. So, um, I'm going to turn it over. I'm not sure who wanted to go first, whether it be Mike Darlington or Tom. Okay, Mike is going to go first. And uh, so I'll turn it over to you and then we'll open it up for lots of questions and we'll take it away. Go ahead, Mike. Good morning, Mayor Roberts and Council. Halliburton Highlands Nordic Trails Association began building and maintaining ski trails in Glee Park over 40 years ago. Uh, about 30 years ago, we built a three bay garage to store equipment. About eight years ago, the municipality assumed ownership of the garage because it was built on municipal land. About 20 years ago, we built, we began using the band shell as a clubhouse for our jackrabbit program and when hosting races. Uh, we stopped using the band shell three years ago due to a deterioration of the structure that made it unsuitable for use. A functional, safe clubhouse is vital to our Jackrabbit program, one of the largest, most affordable youth outdoor recreation programs in the county. The program grew by more than 25% this past season, a trend that we expect to continue in future years. Recently, Council decided to gift land to Fleming College for their residents, 
this requires our current garage be replaced. We have been assured that our current three bay garage will be replaced at no cost to HHNTA. We see this as an opportunity to create a suitable clubhouse as an addition to that three bay garage. Uh, we are submitting a feasibility study today for your consideration and as a way for HHNTA and DICERT to commit to this important community project. Thank you. Adam Brady is a ski club member and architect is available to answer questions about the feasibility study. Tom Lambert, the chair of HHNTA is also available. Okay, so um, Adam, do you want to share some of your conceptual drawings and maybe um, then Tom you can chime in about like you, you have a sort of subcommittee working on uh, which are feasibility, what, what specifically is required. You have approximately a thousand square foot garage right now uh, that houses all your equipment. Um, and so uh, you're looking for a space that not only houses your equipment, but also can have that warming center included in it. So um, Adam, do you want to do share screen and go to your presentation? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I will keep this as, as brief as, um, sorry, wrong screen. I'll keep this as brief as I can. Um, you know, as, as Mike mentioned, you know, I am a member of the, uh, the ski club committee. Uh, I am doing this as a volunteer, but I do happen to be a licensed architect here in Ontario and as well in BC. Um, so I've been working with the committee over the last couple of months to help them uh, prepare a feasibility study to generate a concept for the new garage and clubhouse, uh, and then have sourced um, some pricing information from local contractors just to get a sense of projections of what we could be looking at as a total cost uh, looking towards uh, 2022. Um, so uh, just to remind everyone, we are looking at the proposed uh, site in Glee Park where the ball diamond is. Um, our committee has been working to generate a concept and just to flash right ahead, this is the, uh, the final image that we essentially have been working towards. Um, and just kind of how we got there is we started to look at uh, the overall layout of the building, where do we want the garage bays facing, what kind of program spaces do they need. Um, and then ultimately we've been able to generate a plan that is kind of an off keel uh, square of the two. Uh, where we've got two garage bays kind of facing the entrance to the park. We've got the Jackrabbit Bay facing towards the, uh, the existing band shell. Um, and then the warming, uh, the warming hut is kind of this area at the bottom uh, with a bit of an outdoor space. And that kind of faces onto the main field and uh, kind of looking at the overall sculpture garden area and that open plain where um, the trails all meet. Um, and so we went through a series of masking studies, organization to look at what were the best options for uh, the group. Um, layouts, orientation, et cetera, et cetera, sizing, all that fun stuff. Uh, then we started looking at uh, roof exercises, what was going to be simple from a construction standpoint, what was going to give the building the right look. Um, and then, you know, what were ways that we could manipulate it to try to create additional space without much additional cost. Um, we looked at materials. So we looked at steel roofs, uh, wood siding, um, steel siding, wood accent, um, combination of the two. And so ultimately, you know, we've tried to create a, uh, create a building that kind of allows itself to be adaptable into the ever rising cost of materials and availability. So um, that's kind of where that sits. And then this is the concept again that we've generated. So this would be the facade that faces the current entrance to the park. Um, and as we see, we've got an asymmetrical sloped roof here, but really simple, um, you know, gable pitch. Um, easy to construct, easy to fabricate. Um, and then as I talked about, we looked at how uh, this simple roof profile could extend over some of the pushing and pulling of the building to create some additional space at what we see as a very low cost. Um, you know, majority of this, we're looking at, uh, you know, a combination of wood uh, siding, wood accent, and then maybe throw in some steel siding just as a feature or not, but it's really um, for us to just kind of show how materiality could be explored um, based on cost. Uh, this would be the back corner that kind of would be facing the majority of the field. Um, so you can see the garage door in this image would be the access to the Jackrabbit Bay. And then where you see all of this glazing would be the club's uh, finished warming area. And then we continue to rotate around the back of the building. Uh, this covered area could be, again, just an extension of the roof line. 
uh, but easy to get covered outdoor space to allow for, um, you know, easy storage to, uh, to sleds and other machines while they're running, being maintained, things like that in nicer weather. Uh, and then we continue to spin around and we see the two, um, we see the two uh, garage doors that would lead into the bay. And so as a concept, that's, uh, that's really it. And so, like I said, I've been doing this as a volunteer, um, but the processes that I would take would be no different than uh, if I was hired to do this job um, in terms of the concept generation, the, uh, you know, the biannual meet or biweekly meetings with the committee um, and just kind of the back and forth in terms of generating from a, a, a 2D to a 3D to a, you know, paper cartoon building in a sense. And like I said, this is, uh, as Mike mentioned, this is a feasibility study. So it's just really for the committee to get a, a, an appetite of what, uh, what this could look like moving forward. So um, if you don't mind it, unsharing your screen. Sure. And we'll go back to full view. Okay, so Tom, I'm gonna to turn it over to you if you wanna add a little bit and then we'll take some questions and... Uh, Tom, you I don't really have a lot to add. I think uh, Adam and Mike have provided all the pertinent information for this presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, keep in mind, uh, what Mike Garlington said, and we always have to be cognizant of it. Um, I don't see Mike on the screen anymore. I'm oh, there you are. I'm sorry, pardon me. I was looking <laughs> over in the wrong spot. Um, that, that it is Dice Art's obligation. It, it's a, uh, really, you can call it a direct contribution, although we're not contributing to the college. It's, it is purposes for the college. So our obligation is to do a garage. The, uh, extra or how big or how grand or or other things that they uh, want to do maybe will be within the speed club. I think uh, we do have a fairly broad resolution that's in our packet that, that is on the floor for today which is to acknowledge the presentation um, and to direct a report be brought back to a future meeting to council for approval once an estimate of construction costs has been acquired. I think we would have to obligate on our side of what uh, a reasonable sized garage would cost to build, including all the landscaping, like absolutely start to finish to, to where our financial contribution would be for this. But I'm going to open up to the floor for uh, questions. Currently, I, like I said, I was working with Deputy Mayor Kennedy, so I think we'll need another council to be part of this project. Um, Councilor Clark? Mr. You, Madam Mayor, um, Adam, very nice design. The uh, I see the great opportunity you fellows have seen with, with having a space with some glazing and natural light, and and I think it's going to be a you know a very you know a very positive thing going forward. Um, Mike, I, I guess what I'm also looking at is the opportunity of Fleming College having a residence there and 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 being in a natural environment and a, and a group that perhaps could be engaged in, in working on some of the trails with you or being being partners in, in promoting and you know, good health among the among these young artists and what perhaps that could do to to raise your profile as well. So I, I see a real win-win opportunity there. And and uh, you know hopefully there's 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 some connections that you'll be able to make with the college and make that happen. Thank you. Are there any uh, further questions? Councillor Smith. Uh, hey, thank you. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, Adam, uh, uh, thank you for your contribution in, uh, in um, you know, moving this along with some uh, uh, expertise that um, uh, you've, uh, you know, voluntarily provided a uh, big contribution to the whole effort. Um, I was curious, uh, and I don't know whether it's uh, Tom or Mike or whoever might answer this, but, uh, you know, when the material received, uh, um, you know, this, uh, the building was described as, a, as another wonderful asset to the municipality uh, that would be leased solely to the ski club. Um, and um, so that suggests that it would be for the exclusive use of the, of the ski club. Um, is, that, is that correct? Did I interpret that correctly? That's, that's correct. There's a long backstory to that that basically revolves around zoning. Um, if it is available to other multiple other groups or other groups to use, it becomes a, it's a different zoning and it would put our costs up significantly. It's the building code. 
it's it's the occupancy assembly, not zoning. It's an occupancy assembly. So the so continue, Mike, and then I'll add. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so maybe you could explain it better. I, there's a very good reason why it's set up that way. So well, I, I can I can so jump in if you if you don't that. mind. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a it's a it's a use. Um, so it's how the building's classified. And so uh, right now what we're looking at is a part nine group D and that's a business or personal service. And if you're looking to, uh, because, and, and that would mean that the business or personal service that owns the building or leases it, in this case, the ski club would be the sole operator. Um, and then if you want to create something that's more of a general use or public use, you look into, as Andrea mentioned, uh, sorry, as Matt, the mayor mentioned, um, it is a, an assembly occupancy, which is a group A, which warrants uh, the inclusion of an architect to submit the building for, um, for permit and site plan approval. So uh, there's a cost implication to that, but there's also a design. Um, so not just the front end cost of hiring an architect, but also the design, because then that would warrant um, washrooms, uh, accessible washrooms and things like that. And so if we're trying to keep costs down and be true to the use of the building, it's simply a, a building code exercise. And so that's that's why the the, the building would have sole use, uh, Councillor Smith. But that would not uh, close off the fact that if, for instance, in the summertime or another time of year, somebody wanted to rent that space from the ski club, the agreement would be to be a municipal building on municipal property leased back for the sole use of the ski club who could then sublease to a group who wanted to use it if they so chose. Um, but we, it wouldn't be say, for instance, like a community center, uh, which has occupancy assembly or this building, even a municipal building or a library or that type of thing. But it would be open to other groups to uh, rent from the ski club. Is that what you're saying? I think that, right. would, that, would that would be at the, yep. if I could address that, please, that would be at the discretion of the ski club. So the financial responsibility of Dysart is to rebuild the section of this building that basically is replacing the three bay garage. Um, and the agreement with that has been that that's been the exclusive use of Nordic trails ever since you have leased it to us. Um, we occasionally let other people use that garage, um, but that's up to the discrepancy of the club. The actual clubhouse section of that, then, yeah, that would be up to the club as to whether a group could use it or not, because we will have paid for that and we would have had the exclusive lease with the with Dysart. There's, I mean, there's some really great ways around this. So a lot of folk are familiar with um, the dance presentation that happens in the sculpture forest every year. And they have in the past used our ski club or our clubhouse as a staging area for that. Um, we would love to support that. And it's a simple matter of them just paying for a membership for the club, and then they have access to that um, space. Okay. And, and so uh, your thought with this uh, structure uh, is that, uh, um, you know, uh, you're looking to Dysart uh, to replace the old garage uh, with a brand new garage. Uh, and then the ski club is going to uh, uh, pay the costs of the, uh, of the clubhouse and the other uh, ancillary areas of, uh, of this old structure. Is that what you had in mind? Yes. So what we're looking, what we're looking for Dysart is to essentially replace the building that is being taken down um, due to their, you know, the MOU that um, is involved with the entire Fleming residence. Um, and everything beyond that through the cost of the three bay garage is the financial responsibility of the club. Okay. So thanks, Councillor Smith. And so that at this point, really, um, the, the, the three gentlemen are here at my request. And my, myself and Deputy Mayor Kennedy have been working with them, with staff. As I said, I've been kind of spearheading this as a responsibility uh, that I feel we owe to the, absolutely not, I feel like we do owe to the ski club. And I also think that, um, you know, time is of the essence. It's one of those things that we can say, oh, as I said, you know, looking for construction for next year, but we really need to get all our ducks in a row. We really need to get the clear understanding between the ski club and us and uh, there's a lot of moving parts. So the earlier we act on this and we all come to the table and we're 
we know what, who's doing what, who's paying for what, and who's responsible for what, the better. Um, and I think it would be ideal to have all of this in place so that construction could start on this in the spring of next year. So all that's happening right now is that we've requested a report to, now I'm not sure, uh, Mallory, which staff, because uh, I had been asking a couple of staff to join in, but that's planning and building department. I don't know what staff I can uh, put this on, and perhaps you, I'm not sure. And also I would request another councillor join me in these meetings. Um, perhaps Councillor Wood Roberts, who is the um, chair of the Green Park Committee, if you're able to do that, uh, so that we continue the conversations as we go forward where we can come back with a, a report to council. So, um, Mallory, do you want to, and Ken and Councillor Smith, yeah. What, what's the question, Mayor Roberts? Sorry, I want to make sure in, in the resolution it says, and further direct the re report be brought back to a future meeting. And I was questioning which staff would take the lead responsibility in this. I have been taking the lead on this, moving this project forward, calling the meetings, asking Jeff to do this and Carl to do that. At this point, it, it's coming up to costs of a estimate construction costs of a thousand square foot garage. It's not under Jeff's purview or Carl's. Would you be the staff member that would be? Who would I think Tamara can answer that better than me, probably. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah, I'm typically the staff person who looks in after any construction or infrastructure. Okay, thank you. So we'll have Tamara and we'll have Councillor Wood Roberts continue on with this. Okay, and Councillor Smith, you had a question. Yeah, so um, when will we have a discussion, uh, you know, uh, as a council? in terms of what we are actually committing to and, um, you know, and, and where this fits with the other priorities for the community, because, uh, um, you know, I, I understand the, uh, the approach of the ski club and, and were we them, we would be equally assertive in terms of, uh, of our requests or our, our demands. Uh, but uh, we as council, you know, represent uh, the entire community and, um, you know, need to assess where this fits, uh, relative to a variety of priorities and, uh, and also exactly what we want to commit, um, you know, uh, council, commit our community to doing. And yes, we haven't okay. had any of that discussion yet. I mean, you've had some meetings and raised a proposal, but, uh, um, you know, uh, council hasn't really had any uh, discussion here. Um, and so I'm curious as to when that's going to happen. Well, I think that's the purpose of the of the delegation and the and the bringing it to council today is to right now I've been acting um, with with the deputy in in good faith to bring it to today to then bring it to staff because we because I don't direct staff to do anything by myself so that now once we get those construction costs we can say here's construction of this would be a stick frame this is a prefab steel building this is a this and we'll get a good indication from let's call it our side as to what our then financial commitment should be building materials have gone up through the roof uh, a friend of mine just built a um, 2200 square foot steel garage and i asked him prices on that so i have i have that that included the foundation um it's not it's it's a functional garage it has no aesthetic uh, qualities of uh, of what some of the designs that Adam just showed us, but it, it's be a starting point. So that's when council will have the discussion and when staff come back. So that's what the resolution says today to continue to work together that a report be brought back to a future meeting to council for approval once an estimate of construction costs has been acquired. So I think that's, that's, kick, that's the next step. Does that fairly answer your question? Uh, uh, sure. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, um, and hopefully those estimates, uh, there might be multiple estimates in terms of, um, you know, a, a basic garage structure, uh, as opposed to uh, a more grandiose one. And, um, you know, a, a garage is a place that uh, some equipment can be stored. Um, and, um, you know, one wouldn't characterize the existing facility as a architectural mod model of, uh, you know, uh, what might be desired, but it, it is, you know, a, a 40 or 50 year old building and uh, it stores some equipment. Um, and, um, and that's, 
you know, uh, at least uh, kind of an initial sense of what we might do and, uh, um, you know, uh, where it's located and, uh, and what's involved. Those are all things that council needs to talk about and assess, as I said, relative to other priorities. Absolutely. And that's what I did say. We would come back with several designs. Um, Councillor Wood Roberts and then Mike Darlington. Um, just further on that subject, we did make a commitment with the ski club that we would partner for a new facility with a warming area and an area for storage of their equipment. Um, and we did that when we approved um, the student residence at Fleming. We also don't want something that's not aesthetically pleasing and that doesn't fit in with the theme of Glee Park. So I think that that's our goal as a committee to, to make all those things work and bring it back to council for a final decision. But we did make a commitment to partner with them previously. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, like I said, time is of the essence. That's why it may seem like yeah. this. Just, sorry, just I, you know, uh, if I might. Uh, council hasn't committed uh, to build warming stations and, uh, and a clubhouse. Uh, yeah. That's been talked about. But there's been no formal commitment by, uh, you know, by council to that. And uh, as I said, there's a lot of priorities across our community. Um, and, um, you know, uh, many of us might look and say, um, you know, this community isn't just the village of Halliburton. It's far reaching. And, um, you know, uh, uh, we've put a lot into the village, uh, in the parks. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, before we commit to additional investments there, I'd like to make sure that we've had a discussion about all priorities and, um, and what else we might be doing in other areas of the community. Okay, fair enough, but we will be coming back with this report. Mike Darlington was next and then Councillor McKechnie. I think actually, uh, Councillor Wood Roberts addressed one of my, I guess, points. The you know we're on, we're both on the uh, Glee Park committee and we're you know being on there and just generally living here. Very concerned about the appearance of Glee Park and maintaining and trying to enhance the appearance. They've had a number of terrific additions: the entryways, timber frame buildings. Um, it, you know the current garage is old and looks old. Um, we would hope to build something that is aesthetically pleasing and fits in well and serves a purpose now and into the future. Um, and we were addressing about, perhaps there's a comment about the, you know, serving the village of Halliburton. Well, I, I would suggest that we actually have um, our Jacoba program and our ski program serves the entire county. In fact, we have people coming from, driving from two hours away to attend the Jacoba program. They have cottages here. Uh, it's a big draw. I know people who bought their cottage up here because of our ski trails were available. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And uh, Councilman Keckney, you wanted to add something in the wall? Yeah. Um, needless to say, uh, I've never cross-country skied in, uh, at the uh, Glee Park, and, uh, but I know that I've been here a long time, and I know how popular it is, and um, I, I, I just want them to go away with a uh, a feeling that uh, there is, uh, you have one counselor who realizes the importance of, um, of, the, of the program of 40 years to continue. And contrary to what somebody might think, the village of Halliburton has a lot to do with the municipality of Dysart. And uh, the, the ski club has been a very big part of that. And anything for our youth today, um, like, like arena shutting down, Glee Park shutting down for the rabbit program. Those are such negatives. So let's not even talk about negatives. Let's just work together and move it forward. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, it, it will. Thank you. We'll, we'll be coming back with a report. That's the purpose of the, uh, me requesting the delegation today and to then direct staff to get those preliminary costs. We will come back uh, with not only the costs, but of an action plan of how to fund them. I promise you that. So I do need a mover and a seconder. I've read most of the resolution, but I'll reread it. Councillor Clark and seconded by Councillor McKechnie. I'll read it again. Be it resolved that Council acknowledge receipt of the presentation from representatives from the Halliburton Highlands Nordic Trail and Ski Club Association and Mayor Roberts regarding the preliminary design and concept for the new ski club garage in Glebe Park and further directs that a report be brought back to a future meeting to Council for approval once an estimate of construction costs has been acquired. All in favor? Okay, and that is council. 
uh, carried, that is carried. Uh, keep in mind, this is a future council meeting. It will not be at next council meeting. I'm hoping uh, that everybody can take a little bit of a break in July. So do not expect any report back until August or September. And uh, we'll reconvene with members of the ski club. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Tom, for attending our meeting today. And uh, on behalf of the Nordic Trails Association, thank you for your consideration. I really, uh, I, we really do appreciate this. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, we do have a second delegation uh, I'm, that is due at 10.15, so we're just a wee bit behind. This delegation will likely take some time. If that's okay, we'll continue, and then we'll take our, our recess after the second delegation. If there's anyone that needs a quick two-minute break, you can turn your screen off and go do that. If not, we're going to bring Jim Blake in uh, to speak to the Culture Resource Committee delegation to council. Keep in mind, the um, Culture Resource Committee was scheduled to meet this Thursday, and we called uh, through the chair, Councillor Donaldson, and all the committee members. We were able to meet on June 10th to purposely bump up the, the Culture Resource Committee meeting to bring these recommendations forward today in a timely manner, which I believe is the last day of school, uh, all be it virtual. So Jim, I'm gonna turn it over to you and um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. So welcome, Jim Blake. And just um, there we go. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Roberts and uh, council members. <clears throat> I'm uh, here on behalf of the uh, Cultural Resources Committee. Uh, the committee was uh, requested by the Dysart et al. Council to review the issue related to the mural wall of sports heroes on the A.J. LaRue Community Centre and make recommendations to Council. The Cultural Resources Committee created a subcommittee to undertake the review with the following mandate. <clears throat> the purpose of the subcommittee was threefold. To establish criteria for recognition on the A.J. LaRue Community Centre mural wall, the criteria should recognize a very high standard of excellence in athletics and also remove any barriers to inclusion as outlined by the Ontario Human Rights Code. Race, ancestry, place of origin, color, ethnic origin, citizenship, creed, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, age, marital status, family status, or disability. These criteria will be recommended to the Cultural Resources Committee and through this committee to Municipal Council. Uh, second item was to recommend candidates for recognition on the mural wall based on uh, who meet these criteria. This list of candidates will be recommended to the Cultural Resources Committee and through this committee to the Municipal Council. And the third was to make recommendations to the Cultural Resources Committee related to the process of choosing future candidates and ongoing management of the mural wall. <clears throat> These uh, processes will be recommended to the uh, Cultural Resources Committee and through this committee to Municipal Council. The Cultural Resources Committee created a subcommittee with three representatives from the committee, including a council member, two student representatives, uh, and a teacher from J.D. Hodgson Elementary School, and a representative from the Halliburton Highlands Sports Hall of Fame. This subcommittee uh, met three times with a lot of work uh, being done between sessions. In that time, they drafted a set of criteria and policies for the mural wall as described in the subcommittee mandate. They received recommendations and a detailed background information from the JDH grades seven and eight class for Tally Williams and Leslie Tashlin to be honored on the mural wall. And they created a process and nomination form for the nomination of future candidates for the mural wall. These proposals were brought forward to and presented to the Cultural Resources Committee on June 10th, 2021. With unanimous consent, the Cultural Resources Committee has made the recommendations to Council for the approval and acceptance of all three of these proposals. We would like to provide a bit of background on the recommendations. A number of factors uh, were looked at when we were developing the criteria. One, that the criteria needed to be inclusive of the five athletes already represented on the wall. Two, that athletes uh, considered must have a connection with Dysart et al. in their formative years. Three, that athletes have uh, had a significant athletic accomplishments in their formative years. 
Four, that after high school, they achieve excellence as athletes in an organized sport at an elite level, elite level. And five, they serve as a positive role model and an inspiration for local youth. You can see by reading the draft criteria that all of these areas have been covered and described in detail. We've included in the policy document a definition of sport, which comes from Olympic standards and other international definitions. We also define the term formative years. Using these criteria, we view the proposals for Tally Williams and Leslie Tashlin to be on the mural wall. These two athletes, as do the five athletes already represented on the wall, meet all of these criteria. Leslie Tashlin was the first Halliburton resident to represent Canada at the Olympics, and Tally, Tally Williams was the first student from Halliburton Highland Secondary School to play in the Canadian Football League. Both of these athletes have athletic records at uh, Halliburton Highland Secondary School that stand to this day. They are both exemplary, positive role models for the youth of our community. The grade seven and eight class from JDH submitted all of the requisite materials for these nominations, and this material was reviewed and verified. Given that these individuals are and were eminently qualified to be honored as sports heroes in the mirror wall, and that these athletes were not considered when previous decisions were made about individuals being honored, it was recommended that they be immediately approved for recognition on the mirror wall. The subcommittee and the cultural resources committee were unanimous in the recommendation to cancel that Tally Williams and Leslie Tash will be honored on the AJ LaRue Community Center Wall of Sports Heroes. To reinforce these recommendations, I would like to share with council a short video of the JDH students presenting their essays in support of the nominations. And Mallory, if you could please cue the video. Sorry, Jim, I don't have it up on my computer, but I can get it up, one second. Is everyone seeing my screen? Yes. Yep. Perfect, okay, before I play it and just say silent, one second. Mallory, the volume. Yep, go the volume, Mallory. Is the volume not working? It's too low. Oh, it's too low. Okay. I'm not sure how to change that for the screen. I've got it on 100% on my computer. Let's see if I can edit it here. I did view it at home. So I don't know. We'll see the sound quality and I'll let you know. And if not, maybe we'll move on, Jim. It was fabulous, um, but I did, counselors did receive it in their package. I'll try it again one more time. I'll, I've tried to adjust it a bit. So we'll okay. see, we'll see if it works. Okay, one sec, let me know. No. No, so, so Jim. I'll get Mallory to unshare. It is on the public agenda, not just for counselors to see. Uh, so I'm gonna encourage anyone listening to please uh, if you're viewing it on YouTube, but they can also follow along in the agenda and to view that video uh, later. It's coming from the voices of the, the kids uh, speaking to these two athletes is very moving. So uh, I, please do take the time to watch that. Okay. Yes. In the uh, uh, the students uh, worked uh, very hard to uh, to put together this uh, video for uh, for council, so you, you can hear in their in their own words. Uh, they undertook an enormous amount of research 
uh, but um, very moving essays on uh, the recommendation uh, for, uh, for Tally and, and Leslie. The third aspect of the recommendations from the Cultural Resources Committee is about the mural wall going forward. The recommendation is to create an open and transparent process where individuals can be nominated in the future. We were fortunate to have the experience of the Halberton Highland Sports Hall of Fame and all of their research to help us develop the nomination process. The details of this have been included with your meeting documents. This completes our delegation in support of the resolutions before you. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter. We would be happy to answer any questions at this time. So I'll turn it over to questions. But first of all, I want to thank you personally, Jim, for the enormous amount of time. Like you said, three meetings, but also taking the time to uh, create the presentation. It's just not the meeting times. Yourself and the other people mentioned in the subcommittee, uh, Councillor Tammy Donaldson, for her participation in this. This has been uh, uh, well thought out, well talked about, uh, and taken extremely seriously. And this all stemmed from an email that I received at the beginning of March from some grade seven and eight students. So uh, I commend those students to, to begin that process and, and start a letter and send it to their mayor, which put it on council, which it may seem very bureaucratic and red tape that went to a committee and went to a subcommittee. And then that committee comes back to council and here we are today. But in terms of how government works, uh, three months, that's like lightning speed. So, so that's very quick. Uh, but Jim, thank you. And to all the people that served on that committee and Councillor Donaldson as well. So now I will open it up to the, uh, uh, to the clerk first. Sorry, I just, I wondered if I could try the video one more time through a different media outlet here. And cause I think it's important to play it if I can. So I'm gonna try it. Um, I was trying it through a browser, doesn't matter. I'm just gonna try it through something else right now, if that's okay. Of course. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so let me know if you can hear it. No. No, you can't hear it? Oh, okay, well that's too bad. That's, that's okay, it's, I, I don't know how, how all of that works, but I, I'm sure that every counselor would have watched it. And so really I'm just recommending to the members of the public who are watching our meeting today to go, because they're watching on YouTube so they can't watch the video at the same time. But uh, to when they finish watching this, go to see that video. Their voices are, mean a lot. And I'm sorry we're not able to present it publicly. But um, I, Councillor Smith, do you had your hand up first for questions? Well, I uh, actually didn't have a question, but I, I was going to make a comment. Uh, it is unfortunate that we can't hear the uh, video, Jim, because uh, um, it was a fabulous video. Um, and the students, uh, you know, use of the wow concept, uh, you know, left me with my own wow, which was, it's remarkable how inspired uh, these students have been uh, by the work they did, uh, you know, researching the, uh, the background of both Leslie and Tally and the, um, you know, the uh, enthusiasm, if you like, the passion uh, with which they shared their beliefs uh, in that video. And uh, so, uh, to the students, but to everyone involved in it, uh, uh, it's really uh, been a rem I, I thought that the uh, the criteria that uh, your committee put together was uh, was very thoughtful, very thorough, and uh, and ought to serve uh, the community well for uh, for many years to come. Uh, it's very evident from the the research the students had done and the uh, presentation that they make in that video that. Uh, both Leslie and Tally are, are well deserving of, uh, of recognition uh, on the, uh, the walls of the arena or community center. And uh, so, uh, you know, to you, but particularly to the students involved, uh, congratulations on a, uh, a tremendous uh, you know, piece of effort, a piece of work uh, for our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Any other further comments? There's a very lengthy resolution, which I will, endeavor to read without uh, without um, making any mistakes but it all it, 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 it was in our package so councillors will be able to uh, see that it, it not only adopts the policy but it is recommending that those um, athletes Leslie and Tally uh, 
go on the mural wall and then therefore go back to uh, creation of a committee to look for the funding under the policy and how that will be uh, go forward from there. I can assure you uh, if anyone is goes on Facebook, there is already a group chomping at the bit. So Barbara, we're going to have to work with you to how to receive, I believe you've had requests of um, how to receive some of the, the donations to help fund this. Uh, we don't know what the total cost will be to date, um, but that's part of within the resolution to, to look for requests for quotes. Um, so we'll have to work with our treasury department. There are people uh, all over with comments saying, I get your, these old fashioned terms saying, get your checkbook out. Now it's like, where do I click and go fund me? And they want to do something online. So we'll have to uh, get that rolling quite quickly. Is there any other comments from councillors? Councillor Donaldson, is there anything you want to add as you were a member of the subcommittee? and chair of culture resource? <laughs> um, no, this, this was an awesome past process. It was amazing um, how they all pulled together and I added the extra meetings to make it happen. And uh, Jim's work in it was truly amazing to, to get it all started uh, once the students um, stepped up. Uh, so it was, it was actually, it was really, really good on how it all fell in together and uh, and it was, it's great that we'll be able to recognize them from Halliburton. Uh, wonderful. So um, Barbara, did you want to speak to, or is that's a little early stages? We'll have some internal discussions. We'll, we'll, we know in this day of social media that, uh, you know, like I say, I've already seen all these things. Believe me, people who are listening today, we will make it very clear how you can donate and how you will get a tax receipt. And so uh, actually, Barbara, we'll, we'll discuss that internally um, and, and see how we can do that. And we will make that very public, shareable. We'll tweet it, we'll tomorrow, we'll TikTok it and or <laughs> however we do all the social media platforms to make that information readily available to all people. Uh, Councilor McKechnie. Yeah, I was just wondering, Jim, and uh, the rest of the committee, uh, Gary, if Gary broman has been in touch with you at all. He has some ideas in regard to how to put the mural on the wall. It might save some money. Uh, he was trying to explain it to me one day. Um, but um, if you haven't talked to him yet, you should leave, give him the time and listen to him because it, it sounded like it, it would save some money and it, and it would look very, really great. So uh, I'll leave that over to you guys now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Councillor uh, Councilor McKechnie. And the... Uh, uh, Gary Broman uh, wrote a wonderful letter in terms of recommendation for, for Tally and, and Leslie, as, uh, Leslie as well. So thank you, Councillor McKechnie. Yeah, for, for the rest of council, uh, Jim, maybe just before I read the resolution, you can um, let the rest of council know the reach that this has had and some of the letters that were received and comments from um, people far and wide across the country and beyond. Uh, without disclosing too much, if you wanted to share a little bit. Uh, so, so certainly um, this has put uh, Halliburton in, uh, in the news uh, across, across the country. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the students as part of their uh, nomination package uh, um, <clears throat> received a, uh, a letter of commendation from Pinball Clemens, uh, which uh, I, I believe that pinball uh, might have actually played with uh, played with tally. Um, so, but this has been picked up uh, by uh, news sources uh, through the CFL and also Athletics Canada. Uh, it's been in the Toronto Star and um, it the Waterloo Warriors, uh, all the alumni papers, uh, you know, etc. Um, the Olympic uh, folks. Um, so we're being watched right now by people across North America. But it's pretty exciting when you think about it, that a, that a letter from some grade seven and eight students were able to generate that interest and that conversation. And uh, essentially, I guess you'd say we were writing a wrong that was overlooked, that was not, it was, it was not brought to my attention. And I've been on council for a while now. So I I'm, I'm appreciate that they did that. Without further ado, I uh, the councillors do have the resolution in their package, so I guess I'll ask for the mover, seconder, and then read the councillor Clark and second by councillor Donaldson. 
Bear with me. Be it resolved that Council acknowledges receipt of the presentation from the representatives from the Cultural Resource Committee regarding a proposed mural policy and nomination process and further that Council adopts policy number 64, which establishes the eligibility criteria nomination process for an individual to be honored by a mural on the wall of the AJ LaRue Community Center mural wall as written. And further, whereas the purpose of the AJ LaRue mural wall is to recognize individuals who spent some of their formative years attending school and or being involved in athletics in the municipality of Dysart et al. And who went on to achieve excellence as athletes in an organized sport at an elite level who serve as positive role models and an inspiration for local youth and that the athletes Leslie Tashlin, the first Halliburton resident to represent Canada in the Olympics, and Tally Williams, the first student from Halliburton Highlands Secondary School to play in the Canadian Football League, meet all of the criteria for an athlete to be recognized on the AJ LaRue mural wall. And be it resolved that Council approve Leslie Tashlin and Tally Williams to be honored on the AJ LaRue mural wall. And further, that Council directs the Cultural Resource Committee to undertake the procedure as outlined in the policy to select artists, identify costs, and initiate the fundraising for the creation of the murals. And further, whereas the two athletes have been uh, recommended to be honored on the AJ LaRue mural wall, Council directs a request for quotations to be prepared to solicit proposals from artists for the artwork for murals to honor these athletes. And the re a review committee be struck by the Cultural Resource Committee to review the requests for quotes. All in favor. That was a mouthful. Carried. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, the committee that did that. And uh, there will there was a request to have a earlier meeting. The Cultural Resource Committee does not meet again until uh, end of August. So we will uh, take that into consideration and let the Cultural Resource Committee know of some potential dates to have a um, special meeting. Okay, if, if I may, uh, Mayor Roberts, uh, thank you, uh, Council. Uh, I want to make a special thanks to uh, this to the staff, especially uh, Jeff and uh, Danielle, who did an enormous amount of work behind the scenes to make all this this possible. It uh, you know takes a bit of time to put all these all these pieces uh, together, and of course to uh, to the students from JDH, uh, and especially uh, Caleb and Erica who uh, sat on the committee and. Uh, I think this is a historic uh, thing that's happened here. Uh, it's also the first time that we've actually had students involved in writing policy for our municipality. So well done, everyone. Exactly, clap, clap. And well done, Tally and Leslie. And the Culture Resource Committee wants to make, I, I do know this, we brought it in, a, in conversation, the quality of the artwork will be of utmost importance so that it is best reflects their likeness. Um, so without further ado, we're going to call a recess. I am calling a recess for 15 minutes. So we will uh, re reconvene back here at uh, 5 after 11. So we're now in recess.
Okay, and we are back in session, everyone. And uh, so the next we're into section five, which is the reports and recommendations from local agencies, boards, and committees. And while we don't always have minutes, I'd like to go to each one just to be sure. So Councillor Donaldson, you are up first to let us know what's happening at the Harcourt Community Hall Board. It's about the same as the last report, um, but I do know that they have it rented out for the summer again for that one person um, that uses it like last year. So they are happy with that, that there is, is producing some income. Do they have a plan as uh, we will hopefully fairly soon by the end of the summer, uh, be able to start doing some inside rentals and gatherings? Like, do they, are they, are they ready? Do they know what the rules are? I think that um, when I asked about that, they were just waiting for direction from, I guess, recreation. Um, so uh, I don't think that they have started anything yet as to how, how it's gonna happen maybe come like once the rentals done, I think in September. Okay, well, we'll be sure through our EOC group to make sure that all the both community centers uh, know exactly where things are at because, um, you know, just like with second dose vaccines, I never assumed that I'd have my second dose as early as I had. Things might change quickly and we'll make sure that that gets communicated out to the both, both um, Harcourt and West Guilford. Okay, thank you, Councillor Donaldson. So then I'll turn to Councillor Smith for West Guilford. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so again, we haven't uh, yet met. The, the hope was, I, and I was speaking with Tanya last night about this, uh, um, we'd like to have a meeting next week, but she's waiting for uh, confirmation that that'll be permitted. We do not have, uh, you know, Zoom meetings. Uh, the group, a uh, small group, uh, half a dozen people would like to meet face-to-face -face at the community center uh, next Monday night. So if... Uh, uh, and Tanya's checking with the health unit, but if the uh, emergency uh, group could uh, communicate that that's uh, acceptable now, um, then we'll, uh, we will meet next week. And, uh, and as I discussed before, we have been taking some bookings for a little later this year, but uh, at this point, uh, there's no, uh, nothing, uh, nothing approved in terms of uh, anything uh, confirmed. Um, I had a couple of questions uh, uh, for follow-up. Uh, um, I know I'd asked previously, and, and there was some work uh, being done to get some signs with respect to the uh, water fountain that's been installed around the back. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, there's any awareness yet as to when we might get those signs. And also, uh, a couple of meetings back, uh, you know, we'd had discussion with the pickleball group and, uh, and I'd asked about uh, whether or not uh, uh, resurfacing the, uh, the asphalt that's underneath the ice surface uh, um, for pickleball. It's certainly a large enough area and it, asphalt's in pretty good shape, but it just needs a bit of a top coat to uh, kind of smooth it up. Um, and um, certainly the, uh, uh, the West Gopher group was very enthusiastic about that, but uh, I haven't heard anything further. Uh, are we able to do that? Do we know how much it's going to cost? Uh, where would that fit in the priorities and so forth? Okay, so I will, uh, Tamara, you want to take that and communicate that back to park staff? Uh, yeah, I know we had park staff go out and look at it after uh, that was discussed. So we'll follow up and see what the status is for sure. Okay, so Councillor Smith can expect an email. That's yeah, if, if somebody could get back to me before next Monday when we hope to, that'd be uh, perfect. Thank you. Very good. Um, thank you. And then and definitely you don't need any uh, requests or, or if, if you were to meet outside, you are absolutely permitted at this point. And, uh, so, you know, so depending on what time you meet or maybe it's too buggy to meet outside, but you definitely don't need any, um, uh, you're already approved to meet outside if you're able to do that. I know they've got a nice picnic shelter there. We, we've, generally, we've generally met inside. In fact, we've always met inside during my time as a member of the group. But uh, I understand, yes, uh, four people could be acceptable at a picnic table. Uh, John Howard decided and made a couple of picnic tables. So I'll offer that up. Thank you. Okay. But um, we, can, we can get back to you. 
Um, okay, thanks, John, uh, Councillor Smith. And then next, uh, Councillor uh, Clark on Rails End Report. Um, yes, thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor, what's the stage one opening? The gallery shop is now, as of June 11th, is reopened. Uh, they're only allowed, I think, what, three shoppers in at a time with, with the current, re, with this current stage one. But anyways, at least it's open. It represents about 60 of the local artists, so it's, it's, a, good, uh, it's a good venue for, for local shopping. Um, at, uh, the Arts and Crafts Festival, again, this year is not going to be able to open with the, with the COVID restrictions. Um, which is the prime fundraiser for the gallery. So they, uh, they are continuing or uh, continuing to look at other sources of, of funding to kind of keep things going. They are planning on doing some pop-up um, uh, programs over the summer, um, just to kind of, again, outdoors, small scale, that kind of thing, but just to kind of keep the, uh, you know, the arts uh, and, and, and the local creativity, the local art stuff in, in, in play. Um, a lot of stuff online, again, with regard to the, a lot of the artists that would have shown and been, been attending the uh, Arts and Crafts Festival. Um, that stuff continues to be promoted through the, uh, the online stuff and there's blogs and all that type of thing going. So um, things are busy. Um, but um, again, looking, at, looking forward to things getting back to normal next year and a proper Arts and Crafts Festival. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And it's great to see, uh, I did see uh, Lori do a little post online at the gift shop and there's some beautiful items in there. So that's, that's great to know that that is open. Um, so I do have a resolution to receive the Rails End report. May I have a mover for that? It's Councillor Clark and Council, seconded by Councillor Wood Roberts. It resolved that the council acknowledges receipt of the June 2021 Rails and Gallery and Art Center report. All in favor? Okay, carried. Uh, Halliburton BIA. Council with Roberts. Hi, we didn't have a meeting in May. We are having me, a meeting is occurring tonight. Uh, BIA worked very hard at getting all the flowers put up, uh, the banners and stuff are done. And we wanna thank Andrew for his, uh, his help with, with all those processes. They're working on some marketing brochures. They're very pleased to be part of the downtown sculptures. They are actually very nice. And most days you can see people stopping and looking at them. Going to be working on a downtown map that will be put in a fairly public location and they're having a Canada Day decorating contest for storefronts. So the winner will be chosen shortly after Canada Day. And um, that's about it for right now. Okay, thank you. And I did mention in my opening remarks about how fabulous the town looks and including, uh, uh, I even reached out to the administrator regarding uh, the bridge on Maple Avenue. So there's some uh, flowers there as well. And it just, when there was a, a Facebook post on that. It was just wonderful to see the comments and everyone just said, this town looks so festive. And so it really shows pride of our town, the shop owners and the business owners downtown, uh, of which there's several new uh, businesses too. So I'm excited to be able to actually go into some of these new stores. Um, so anyway, thanks to the BIA for all that they do. Are they still looking at doing a modified Midnight Madness or is the thought that that's just uh, won't be able to happen. That'll probably be a brief discussion tonight, depending on where we, you know, it, it's kind of up in the air. Right now. Thank you. That's okay. Dogs barking. That's fine. Uh, that happened. Okay. So thank you on that. There's no um, minutes. I've got Harvest Halliburton. I know Councillor Clark is probably the same. Yeah, it's um, with with the health unit being the kind of the, the you know the core on that. Uh, they're they're still fully focused on on the COVID rollout. So, again, nothing new to report there. When when the um, um, as as vaccinations and that get get up to speed and they can start refocusing attention, then we'll be back on track. So, okay, you. yes, uh, source protection. Uh, I believe that was Deputy Mayor and Upper Trent Water. Management, yep, I didn't think so. And then Halliburton Village Bioenergy, nothing there. So we will move on into then uh, item six, which is the recommendations from the June uh, Committee of the Whole meeting, of which all the recommendations are there. 
Is there any questions or comments? Anything from our clerk? Anything on there? If not, I'll ask for a mover and a seconder to approve the recommendations made at committee. Uh, Councillor Smith and Councillor Donaldson. We resolve that the recommendations from the June 8, 2021 meeting of the Dysart et al. Committee of the Whole be adopted by Council. All in favor? Okay, carried. Thank you. Moving into section seven, which is back, back, <clears throat> excuse me, back into planning. And the first item, we'll wait till our director of planning comes on board. Our senior planner, Chris Orson. And the first item was the item that we that we reviewed in the um, public meeting this morning. It's the bylaw. So Chris, is there anything you want to speak to this? No, uh, we heard everything this morning through the public meeting and uh, staff have no further comments. Um, therefore, uh, staff recommend that uh, council approve the zoning application. Okay, so move or seconder for that. Councilor McKechnie, Councilor Smith. We resolved that bylaw 2021-41 being a bylaw to amend bylaw 2005-120 for the lands of Coagama Shores Family Trust on plan 19 M2 lot 13 in the geographic township of Havelock, which would change the zone on the subject land from waterfront residential type 5-2 exception zone to waterfront residential type 5-4 exception zone. Be read a first, second and third time Pass sign in the corporate seal attached there too. All in favor? Okay, carried. Uh, the next is a severance proposal. Yep, that's correct. So this uh, this is for file number SV 2021-006 for Lands of Warren. Uh, although there are no circulation requirements for pre-consultation of consents with the municipality, the proposed consent was circulated to appropriate uh, departments for comments as per municipal policy. Uh, to date, no comments were um, no comments were received. Uh, the brief outline is the, uh, the application is proposing to sever the property resulting in one retained parcel and one severed parcel as outlined in the planning report. A uh, brief uh, description of the property. The subject property is waterfront residential and fronts onto Drag Lake, uh, which is a lake trout lake that is not at capacity. The subject property currently has an existing seasonal dwelling and accessory structure within the water setback. In addition, the subject property is well vegetated with steep slopes, um, which is subject to area of use limitation and has a wetland along the rear of the property as identified by the municipal GIS mapping. As per the municipal zoning bylaw section 3.1, an accessory building is not permitted prior to a main building. Therefore, the existing accessory structure on the proposed retained land shall be removed or brought into compliance with the municipal zoning bylaw. A condition was added to allow the applicant time to remove or bring the accessory structure into compliance with the municipal bylaw through the, um, through the process of the consent. Uh, in summary, uh, it is staff's opinion that with the implementation of the proposed conditions, uh, the proposal as submitted will be consistent with the provincial policy statement and generally conform with the municipal official plan. Therefore, staff recommend that council support the general principle of the consent application as submitted subject to the recommended conditions and comments received through pub the public review process. And if council has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, so I'll open it up to the floor for any questions or comments for clarification. Councillor Smith, go ahead. Thank you. Um, one of the things uh, about this, uh, and it's a, uh, you know, a, a, I'll call it a hand-drawn sketch uh, there at the uh, back of the package uh, that shows the retained lot and the, uh, um, you know, the proposed uh, new lot. It's a... Uh, it's interesting that the retained lot, uh, as it's labeled, is uh, is the lot that won't have a cottage on. So it will be a future. The the it'll be the new cottage is going on what they call the retained lot. And um, you know our our zoning bylaw refers to uh, you know when a new lot's created like this, it's supposed to have a uh, 
minimum of uh, 150 meters of, uh, of shoreline. Um, so, uh, you know, the, uh, it seems like it's a little backwards in this situation. Um, but the other aspect of this uh, uh, diagram is that the, even the 100 meters uh, shoreline for the, for the new uh, cottage site is shown along the shape of the shoreline as opposed to the straight line uh, mm -hmm. that we placed in the uh, zoning bylaw, the amended version that was created last October. So I was curious about that. Is is that really uh, is this really meeting the intention of what we want here in terms of uh, of how we measure shorelines, and and specifically the definition that we put in the new uh, zoning bylaw back in October. So even though they they've showed that frontage uh, going along the the frontage of the shoreline, um, when we measure it point to point, it still does meet the minimum requirements of the zone. Um, when you refer to the 150 meters, that's as per the official plan, which um, is in an area of use limitation that you need. Um, typically when you're creating these lots, if it's within an area of use limitation, it's 150 meters or through the uh, site evaluation report, um, which they will, um, as one of the uh, conditions, they are required to do that to ensure that they can um, fit proper development on those on the, on the property. Um, so when you look at the zoning, though, the actual zone for that lot, it's 60, uh, 60 meter frontage um, and those type of things. So it does meet the intent and purposes. Um, and then they're required to go through the zoning um, process to ensure that they meet the requirements of the 30 meter setback for any new development that is happening on that property. Um, I don't know if Jeff, if you have anything that you want to add into that at all. Well, thank you. I think you answered that quite well. So uh, then to clarify, we are prepared to create a new lot, even if it only has a 60 meter, 60 meter frontage? That's correct. It, it, well, and as long as they, uh, through the site evaluation report, um, can support uh, the creation of those lots, if the site evaluation report cannot support those lots um, within the area of use limitation, which would require potentially up to 150 meters. Um, typically, that's that's the minimum if uh, if it is a steep slope or those type of things, as it's uh, through the official plan. Um, but if they can, if it is supported through the site evaluation report and the EIS, um, then a reduced uh, the reduced or to meet the actual zoning would be permitted. And and so in the uh, in the next phase of this, uh, neighboring property owners and the Lake Association would have a chance to uh, to weigh in if they had concerns about uh, additional development in this area, given the nature of the topography. That's correct. So through through this process, we only are looking at it based on our policies. Um, then it goes to the county, which then goes through the public consultation, which is circulated to neighboring property owners, um, which then have that um, ability to be able to have uh, that conversation or if they have any comments or concerns can address them at that time. Okay, and thank you. Who wants to add to, yeah, I was going to say this goes to the land division committee where, pe where people are circulated as well and has to meet their tests. Um, Jeff, go ahead. Yes, thank you. What I was going to say, yeah, the public meeting uh, for the land division is at the county level, but um, Chris has proposed or recommended a condition for a zoning bylaw amendment to the satisfaction of the municipality. So as a condition of consent, this will come to council um, to view a zoning. Um, at that time, we can ensure that uh, the lots meet the appropriate lot frontage, lot area requirements um, uh, for the zone. But as Chris mentioned, mostly in, in most waterfront uh, zones, the standard waterfront requirement or frontage requirement is 60 meters, except for some of the larger lots. Um, in this instance, uh, there may be some uh, steep slopes. So the site evaluation report will indicate whether there is a developable area on that land. Yes, yeah, so, and, and with all that, it has to show uh, the option for the two full tile beds, uh, not just one. one, one is the initial one and one is a backup. And so all that will go, go through the um, land division committee as well. So there are some quite a few conditions which I will read, uh, but after I have a mover and a seconder for this, if I may. 
Anyone? Uh, Councillor Clark and Councillor McKechnie. So be it resolved that council support the general principle of the severance proposal for file number SB-2021-006 on concession seven, part lot eight, geographic township of Dudley, municipality of Dysart et al. to create one new lot subject to the following conditions and comments received through the public review process. Number one, payment of cash in lieu of parkland dedication to the amount of $1,000 for the lot to be severed. Number two, registered owner is to submit a zoning bylaw amendment application to the municipality of Dysart et al. Number three, subject to a site evaluation report, including a scoped EIS to the satisfaction of the municipality of Dysart et al. Number four, subject to a site development plan to the satisfaction of the municipality of Dysart et al. for the pur proposed severed lot. Number five, subject to a severance agreement to the satisfaction of the municipality of Dysart et al. or as required by the SER and the scoped EIS. Number six, subject that the accessory structure uh, on the proposed retained lands be removed or brought into compliance with the zoning bylaw. Number seven, registered owner to pay any outstanding taxes. Number eight, subject to payment of all administration fees owed to the municipality. And finally, number nine, prior to endorsement of the deed, the land division committee is to receive a clearance letter from the municipality confirming that conditions one through eight have been fulfilled. The application is to make a request the applicant excuse me, is to make a request to the municipality for said letter. So all in favor? Okay, carried. And the next is a permission to cross a one foot road allowance. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, South Coast REI Incorporated recently purchased the subject lands, uh, which are a back lot located on Mink Road on Long Lake. The lawyer for the applicant would like assurances that their clients have permission to build a, a driveway and cross the one foot reserve shown on plan 498 um, and therefore are requesting permission to do so from council. Uh, given that the one foot reserve is still on title to the municipality, council permission is required to permit the location of the driveway and therefore provide legal access to the lands identified as lot 15 on plan 527. Um, that's all I have really have for you right now and I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Okay, I'll open it up to the floor for any questions. Pretty straightforward to me. We have to request and so here they are requesting. So will I have a mover and a seconder then? After this, Councillor Donaldson and second by Councillor Smith. We resolve the council grants permission to the registered owners of lot 15 plan 527 to cross the one foot reserve shown on plan 498 at a location to be approved by an entrance permit. All in favor? Okay, carries. Thank you. Is that all for planning today? It is, thank you. Oh, okay. Very good. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, you too. Okay, and... Uh, Normally, the way we're trying to scale things is with committees that uh, the department heads come to committees and uh, basically we approve the recommendations made at committee. But in this uh, case, we need to bring Rob back in, sorry to say, to do a little bit in public works. And he doesn't mind attending council meetings, so that's great. Hi, Rob. Okay, a little bit of change of plans. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, the reason I came to Council is because we don't have committee next month. Um, this is a time sensitive subject, uh, road resurfacing. The last update I had is the, the crews will mobilize again in the middle of July to start pulverizing roads and then to apply gravel and, and resurface after that. So what I'm seeking here is permission to reallocate some funds, some unspent money. Um, you'll, you'll recall the Hydro distribution station on South Street is being reconstructed on, on an adjacent lot. Um, for this reason, um, exclusively, it does not make sense to resurface that road. Uh, they are seeking to have a couple entrances off of South Street, which, you know, in all honesty, I do have some concerns with. Um, we're still in the, the design phase. So they're looking to accommodate two 56 foot trailers that hold generators or transformers, sorry, should they be required in the future. So I just wanna make sure we can safely get them off the road. And 
we do have some drainage issues we need to address on that road as well. So I'm seeking that we cancel that from the 2021 program and that'll give us time to reassess the grading and the drainage in that area. And we can bring that road back at a later date, possibly next year. I'm just, I'm not sure. It depends on the Hydro One construction schedule. Um, through word of mouth, quite honestly, um, we uh, it was brought to light that Winkler Road is going to have a new residence built on it. So there is development happen happening on Winkler Road, which would certainly affect the resurfacing of that road, as well as Boomerang, which is right adjacent to it. So what I'm recommending is we still commit to doing those roads next year. They came up in the program this year for a reason. They need rehabilitation. Um, they're not the only ones, but they certainly did come up this year. And I think we should commit to following through on that next year, assuming the, the development is done. If for some reason it gets put off and there's still going to be some heavy truck traffic or equipment being offloaded on the roads, we would look at that again next year. But I, I think we do need to commit to uh, fulfilling rehabilitation on those two roads, as well as committing to the second section of Boomerang Road. So Boomerang intersects with West Shore Road in two spots and it has two road sections. It only makes sense to do all three road sections at the same time. Um, they all need it, quite honestly. So if all this goes through, the money, the unspent money would cover the rehabilitation of Harrier Road, which is in the same area. Um, again, it is a candidate for rehabilitation. It's going to be triggered in the very near future regardless. Um, I think we should keep that money in the same area it was allocated for. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I know there was, uh, Councillor Smith had, had asked a question about Eastview and agreed Eastview is in similar shape to Harrier, identical shape, quite honestly. The reason I'm recommending Harrier over Eastview is solely, <clears throat> excuse me, Madam Mayor, um, is solely because the, the savings of the deferred projects will cover the cost of Harrier. If you wanna do Eastview, it's a longer road, it's gonna cost more money. Well, I, I think uh, that sounds like a very good recommendation. And it does in here say, I think the concern would be to make sure that we don't forget about it when you bring the um, 2022 roads forward, because uh, if anyone on those roads were told that they were getting done those sections and then they're not, it, it's good justification, but that we won't forget them. They would go as a priority for the 2022 uh resurfacing program. Councillor Smith, I, I don't even see your hand up, but I wondered if you wanted to, it's your area you're most familiar with. Is there any uh, com comments you'd like to make? Uh, well, I, you know, get me going on roads. I'd make a lot of comments, but, uh, um, you know, as I uh, raised at, uh, you know, the Committee of the Whole, uh, both Eastview and Harrier are also in dreadful condition. And uh, in fact, there I had asked Jeff uh, Sisson if there was anything he could do uh, to kind of fix up some of the bad spots on those roads. And, and uh, you know, Jeff's response was, there's nothing that can be done to, uh, to fix those roads. They do need to be resurfaced. And, um, and so uh, uh, Rob has, uh, has given the explanation as to why it's hairier as ahead of each of you. Um, you know, and but that's a responsibility that falls back to council. What we've heard from from Rob here is that um, you know yes, both these roads are in dreadful condition, but they're not I'm not able to repair both roads because of uh, uh, council hasn't given them enough budget, and um, and so you know we we need to uh, keep that in mind when we're looking at the uh, the road work for 2022. Uh, that uh, there are roads out there that are in dreadful condition uh, that didn't get done in 2021 because there wasn't enough money. And uh, so, uh, you know, remember that comes September, October, when we're allocating the budget for, uh, uh, for the coming year. Uh, the other thing that uh, this highlights with, uh, with Winkler, um, you know, is the, is the need to get some sort of road deposit uh, system in when there's damage that occurs. Um, you know, uh, I contacted Rob and, uh, and suggested maybe we defer Winkler because uh, uh, of that construction. It's going to damage the road. And we've seen that uh, elsewhere in the community where roads get damaged as a result of construction. And, uh, and all the taxpayers uh, end up footing the bill for that. And if there was some sort of road deposit system, 
uh, we'd be getting that money back from the uh, owner and, uh, and indirectly from the contractors who do the damage because not all contractors damage roads when they're doing construction. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we need to act on that. Thank you. Okay, what, one thing at a time, maybe Rob, you want to comment, but to, to say there wasn't enough money in the budget, we set a target of a dollar value. We, meaning all of council, we set a target value of the $1.5 million. Then we went around in a lot of circles and finally came to uh, decide what roads would qualify into that dollar value. We've increased our roads budget year over year since this term of council has been going. So we're not here to talk about that particularly, but you, you brought it up. Uh, there is enough money in our roads budget. The money is what we targeted and what we set. What we're talking about now is making a slight adjustment and the explanation of why, first of all, Harrier or Eastview were not to be done in 2021. We're bringing forward one road ahead because financially it meets that sort of target. We will reevaluate Eastview as it comes into the cycle. Um, you've already directed Rob to come forward. In, in the fall with the DOT software engineers uh, to, to go through that. So Rob, is there any comment you wanna make? Uh, yeah, only that the, it was well before my time. I was certainly in the area at the time, but I believe all the roads were resurfaced at the same time. Uh, we're going on 20, 21 years, I would expect. And for those roads to be 21 years old, they certainly don't owe us anything. Um, but with this new asset management plan and our new preservation um, uh, procedures and way we do things now is the intent is these roads won't sit for 20 years without being addressed. You know, we want to keep the good roads good. It just, it just took that long for these roads to get triggered because they were falling underneath the old plan where we did focus on worst first. Yes, we did. We waited till a road was... A 30% or whatever. Um, anyway, so I- but if, you, if you lived on Eastview or Harrier and you drive that road every day, uh, you know, uh, folks on Eastview are gonna be subjected to another year of driving on a road that is 21 years since it was uh, built and surfaced. And, uh, and it's acknowledged by our staff that it's beyond repair. Um, but it and, needs repair. And at one time it would have been on the list for 2021, but again, uh, with uh, higher costs and uh, not enough funding, it didn't get there. So the decision is to uh, defer some roads and include a road. The resolution was included in our package. Is there anyone else who wants to comment or is there someone that wants to move this resolution forward? Councillor Smith, you're moving it forward. It appears a seconder. Councillor Clark. We resolved that council receive and acknowledge this report regarding changes to the schedule of some resurfacing work and that council implement staff recommendations in the report being to cancel South Street road work from the 2021 road uh, surfacing budget to defer Winkler Road resurfacing from 2021 to 2022, to defer Boomerang Road resurfacing from 2021 to 2022, and that both sections of Boomerang Road be included and to in, in the 2022 and to include resurfacing of Harrier Road in 2021, and that the resurfacing work on Harrier Road will be funded from the 2021 capital resurfacing budget. All in favor? Okay, carried. A couple other little things, Rob, the bylaw for the speed. Did you wanna to speak to that or it's just a bylaw? I think we, We've already had the discussion, so I'm really just looking for a mover and a seconder to uh, pass the bylaw. Mover? Could I ask a question, please? Uh, certainly. Just, just wondering, Rob, quickly, uh, what the uh, status of the uh, of the speed limit signs are. Uh, hoping to have them up by July 1st. Thank you very much. Walt, did you was. Were you also putting your hand to move that or? Sure, I'll move it. Thank okay. you. Moved by Councillor McKechnie and seconded by uh, Councillor Wood Roberts. We resolved that bylaw 2021 48 being a bylaw to regulate the rate of speed on roads in and around the areas of Ross, Percy, and Halliburton Lakes be read a first, second, and third time, pass, signed, and the corporate seal attached here too. All in favor? Okay, carried. Uh, 
and the also another bylaw. Just we've had discussion on this, so I should just need a mover and a seconder. And that's Councillor Smith. And seconded by Councillor Donaldson. We resolved that the bylaw 2021 49, being a bylaw to regulate the rate of speed on Irish Line Road, be read a first, second, and third time, past signed, and the corporate seal attached here too. All in favor? Okay. And uh, uh, that's carried, and signs will be going up accordingly, I imagine, Rob. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so thanks for joining us today. Next, we have a bylaw to appoint a new staff member. That's very exciting. I keep uh, trying to meet him, but he's already out of the door doing inspections <laughs> when I arrive. So I have not uh, had a chance to meet Jesse yet. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and uh, thank you to the uh, hiring committee for that. So I need a mover and a seconder to appoint. Councillor McKechnie and Councillor Clark. Being a by, be it resolved that bylaw 2021 50, being a bylaw to appoint a building inspector, Jesse Dillon, be read a first, second, and third time, pass sign, and the corporate seal attached there too. All in favor? Okay, that's carried. And welcome, Jesse, to our team. Uh, and next, we also had discussion on this and uh, to be able to pay using an app, which is pretty cool and up to date. And I imagine we'll be doing some, maybe Cancer Wood Roberts, you can share this uh, resolution and this uh, with, with your BIA at your meeting tonight. Um, that this passed, I think it's passed. I'll look for a mover and a seconder. <laughs> so Councillor Clark and seconded by Councillor Smith. So well, again, we'll use some social media tools to get the message out there and uh, there will probably be a notification on, I'm, I'm assuming on our actual pay display meters that if they wanna be able to pay in this format, this is how you do it. So that people would know that they have the opportunity to use the hotspot that we can check with staff on that. Uh, moved by Councillor Clark and seconded by Councillor Smith, be resolved that bylaw 2021 55 being a bylaw to amend parking bylaw 2010 42 to increase fines and permit the use of the hotspot app as an alternative way to pay for parking, be ready first, second, and third time, pass sign in the corporate seal attached here too. All in favor? Okay, that's carried. Um, maybe uh, Mallory or, or Tamara. When uh, Rob Mashia, Robert Mashia has the um, has that implemented, we can do a little bit of a post about that. Or is it something that they uh, have? A, is a little sticker on our um, pay and display parking meters that uh, people know that that app is is a possibility. Yeah, I think he has signage as part of that, and uh, Robert will ask, also do a post about it. I'm sure on social media. We'll make sure. Perfect. Get that message out. Okay. Thank you. So then under finance, uh, we just, again, this was discussed at Committee the Whole, this is just the bylaw to um, authorize the uh, lease agreement. So I'll need a mover and a seconder for that. Councillor Wood Roberts, and secondly, Councillor Clark. We resolved that bylaw 2021-51, being a bylaw to authorize a lease extension and amending agreement with Robert Hill, owner operated pill chiropractic and physiotherapy, at 7217 Gillard Road, be read a first and second, third time, pass sign in the corporate seal attached here too. All in favor? Okay, passed. Great, they're gonna be there for another five years. Now, under administration, uh, there's several bylaws. I don't know, Mallory, if you want to, should I just keep rolling? Just keep rolling. If any, yeah, if there's any questions, I can answer any. Yeah, the first one's just our standard road naming bylaw. We have three new roads in the municipality, so uh, we need to pass a bylaw, and then it gets sent back to the county who's in charge of road naming. Okay, thank you. Mover seconder for that. Uh, uh, Councillor Wood Roberts and Councillor Smith. I had a question also might ask. That. Absolutely. Sure. So I, I've got the mover seconder and the, I haven't voted, so go ahead. 
Um, who provides signs um, on public roads uh, labeling private roads? So those, you know, blue signs that say it's Main Street or, uh, um, you know, whatever, private road, but it's a, a sign that's on a public road. So <laughs> uh, a sign that's that's on a public road, but it's labeling where a private road goes through, like privately maintained. Is that what you mean, Councillor Smith? Yeah. So, uh, you know, we have lots of uh, private roads that run off of, uh, that intersect, uh, you no know, public road, intersect Dysart Road. You know, so off of Kinesis Lake Road, there's uh, a variety of private roads. And there's a sign on Kinesis Lake Road that says, this is roll and drive or whatever it happens to be. Who provides those signs? Um, and I, I ask because there's a, it seems to be a problem with signs being stolen. Um, you know, uh, um, even if, I don't know if some have noticed, but the, the sign for Irish Line Road that is on Highway 118, uh, somebody came along with a chainsaw a few weeks ago and took that sign. Cut the, cut the post, the wooden post of four by fours or whatever they are, six by sixes, cut the posts and hold a sign that says Irish Line Road. Now, uh, Fowler, on behalf of the province, is going to replace that. Uh, but uh, I was curious as to, we've got in this, um, you know, road naming bylaw, there's lots of private roads. Uh, do we take responsibility for those signs and they disappear? I didn't mean to stump everybody. That's no, well, I actually don't know the answer. So that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. We can follow, follow up. Rob's not on the screen right now. or He'd be able to answer that in a second. But I think between the county and us, depending on where the signs were as well, like we would put the signs up, like you said, the Irish line sign would be put up by the MTO because it's on the MTO corridor. So if there's yeah. specific signs ever that you're worried about or complaints, we can get you an answer quickly. If you just send us any names of, road signs that go missing we can figure out who needs to fix and get that dealt with so for now we're just uh bylaw is on the or the uh, resolution is on the floor which was moved by councillor wood roberts and second by councillor smith uh be it resolved that bylaw 2021-52 being a bylaw to provide for the naming and renaming of all public and private roads within the municipality of Dysart at all be read a first second and third time passed signed in the corporate seal attached here too all in favor Okay, and that's carried and we can find out, I, I would imagine if it's a municipal road, we're responsible for replacing the sign. If it's a county road, they're responsible. And if it's a private road, the private people that live on the private road would be responsible for their signage. People have stolen signs forever. I don't know why, who knows where we go with that. Uh, next is the procedural bylaw. And I do believe that there was a, um, uh, just some slight changes, Mallory, if you want to speak to them at all, uh, you can, or if there's any questions. I've spoken to it, uh, about it a few times here, but um, basically cultural resources redid their committee. We're shifting around um, where planning goes on our agendas so that we're not holding up other staff who need to get out in inspections and so on. Um, but also just amending our electronic meeting procedures to reflect how we actually do them going forward. So um, yeah, just some minor adjustments to the procedural bylaw and it's already been reviewed. So this is the final version. Thank you. And one question I had asked of me is when we go back to in-person meetings, because I was talking about this with somebody where we were and we're already set up here in the council chambers with the audio visual equipment where counselors will be um, We'll, we'll all be together again in the room. However, some people can join in by Zoom. We'll have to uh, talk about whether if a counselor is, for whatever reason, not able to attend physically in the council chamber, but he still or she still want to participate in the meeting as a voting and acting member, you know, what, how that works if we have one counselor attending electronically and six, in person, so maybe you and I and uh, Tamara can have that conversation too, but and you can, yes, go ahead, Mallory. Yeah, um, IT has outfitted our council chambers. So 
eventually we'll have cameras at the back of the room that point to everyone sitting at the table, but we'll also have a large screen. Um, so if anyone's participating remotely, they'll, they'll be on that large screen. So we're still using Zoom actually, but uh, one screen is everyone in council chambers. And then the other screen would be delegations or someone who, who cannot make it to the meeting, a, a member of council that couldn't make it, could participate remotely that way. Councillor Smith would not have been able to make it to the meeting today. There was a, a there is a fire in West Guilford and that road has, was actually closed and perhaps it's open now, but it was closed for a period of time. So it could be a snowstorm, it could be anything, uh, you know, so I do think we need to make sure that we have that in place. Uh, it has to, you know, whatever the rules are is at the request of the clerk and only so many members of council um, can, can attend electronically and what the notification is that. But I think just we're going to end up sometimes with that hybrid situation. Uh, Mallory, yeah. The, the amended bylaw does say that you provide 48 hours oh. notice if you can. Um, but understandably, like for Councillor Smith, he wouldn't have known, obviously. So there might be some situations where we're setting it up, but hopefully it becomes it becomes second nature and we'll have support of some sort so that we can kind of get people in there at last minute if we need to as well. But um, if there's a, if there's a reason that someone is not listed in that section 20, um, it also has that list that it says that you can, it might be permitted at the discretion of the chair. So someone might contact you and it's a very odd reason that we haven't listed. We didn't think we could list every single reason. So, um, and and if you think it's okay, then we can go ahead and, and they can participate electronically as well. Well, that's great. I just wanted to bring that up. It was on my mind. So, um, okay, mover and seconder to uh, approve the bylaw, Councillor Clark I saw, and then Councillor Wood Roberts. We resolved that bylaw 2021-53 being a bylaw to govern the calling place and proceedings of meetings be read a first, second, and third time, pass sign and the corporate seal attached thereto. All in favor? And that's carried. Mind you, I really do look forward to in-person meetings. I'm getting excited about that. So, uh, and then lastly, the appointment bylaw that follows. Um, I will just look for a mover and a seconder for that. Councillor Smith, and seconded by anyone, uh, Councillor McKechnie. We resolve that bylaw 2021-54 being a bylaw respecting the appointment of members of council and public representatives of the municipality of Dysart et al. and to appoint members of council as representatives of the municipality of Dysart et al. to external boards and organizations. We read a first, second, and third time, path signed in the corporate seal attached thereto. All in favor? Okay, and that's carried. All right, um, moving along at a very good pace today, which is great. We have the, uh, the minutes of our committee to hold meeting. And so I will look for a mover and a seconder to receive. Councilor Smith, you want a question as well, or just moving? Just moving, okay. Seconding by Council McKechnie. We resolve the council acknowledges receipt of the draft minutes from the June 8, 2021 committee to hold as information. All in favor? Okay, carried. And then the uh, minutes of the Cultural Resource Committee which we spent lots of time this morning discussing the one topic, but there are some other items that we discussed on there. But I will look for a mover and a seconder. Councillor Wood Roberts and second by Councillor Donaldson. We resolve the council acknowledges receipt of the draft minutes of the June 10th, 2021 Cultural Resource Committee as information. All in favor? Carried, great. And personnel uh, and administration committee minutes. Mayor Roberts, we have a recommendation from, another recommendation from- Oh, I see that, I'm sorry, I was flipping pages and 
I, I see this now. Thank you very much. It is to uh, approve the policy, uh, the uh, updated public art policy. Um, thank you very much for that. And so mover and seconder to do that. Councillor Clark, seconded by Councillor Donaldson. We resolve that council acknowledges receive the recommendation from the Cultural Resource Committee and approves policy number 40, the public art policy as amended. All in favor? Thank you. That was just some updated language. It wasn't anything, uh, actually it was a, a good exercise to go through it. I was part of it at, at the first time around and uh, um, so it was a, a good exercise to go through and make sure that that's updated. And lastly then is the, um, a recommendation from the Personnel and Administration Committee, or first the minutes rather than a recommendation. So we'll do the minutes first and then we'll maybe we'll speak to the recommendation. So we'll move and seconder for the minutes if I could. Councillor McKechnie and seconded. So Councillor Smith. We resolve that council acknowledges receipt of the draft minutes from the June 15th Personnel and Administration Committee as information. All in favor? Okay, carried. And ne next is the recommendation. Uh, so I'm wondering, Tamara, did you want to speak to that at all? Um, well, I've attached a brief report and a job description for re your review. Um, this is a position that's been a long time coming, but we weren't prepared for it in time for budget. <laughs> Um, with everything else going on. Um, so we are recommending the creation of a public works admin support position um, that would, we've had the position reviewed by our uh, pay equity consultant, Mar uh, Marianne Love. And it comes in at band four on the non-union pay grid. Um, we're proposing starting in, in early September in order to get aligned with the next year's budget cycle and getting that support for uh, Rob, um, the position will also look out, will look after all the general support for roads and public works, but also uh, be responsible for things like the uh, health and safety committee coordination for the office here that we've had a hard time getting up and going for lack of resources and time and um, policy updates and so forth and making sure they're communicated appropriately. It'll, we really hope that the position will help with communications in general with the public as being the first point of contact for general queries and so forth and uh, give an extra person for Rob and to rely on to be able to put out the social media posts or website posts to be more proactive with those kind of things, updating the uh, uh, mapping that shows where there's road work going on and so forth. Um, the job description is attached there if anyone has any questions. Uh, we're estimating a cost in 2021 to be roughly uh, 17,000, including all benefits. And while this wasn't included in the 2021 budget, the personnel committee felt that, uh, well, two things. One, that the um, 17,000 can be absorbed within the Rose Department budget this year. Uh, and secondly, to wait until a January 1 start date uh, just to align with the budget um, would delay some of the support and, and uh, that we feel that that department needs at this time. Um, as well, you know, a lot of times it's very hard to be, we, we have customer service as a goal, as a very high priority for us and for staff to be able to answer emails and queries um, in a timely fashion, but when you're out physically on the road is very difficult for, to, to do at times. So this would be like a, hopefully a first point of contact for, for the public works department as well to help speed up those uh, Questions, comments, concerns, etc. Um, and then there's a there's mm. stuff that happens that uh, that the, that Rob needs support. So, any comments on that, uh, Councillor Smith? Um, so I, you mentioned seventeen thousand is the cost for the twenty twenty one. What would be the full? year costs for this because we'll have to pay the whole bill in 2022. I do you know what I don't have that handy on yet it's going to be at the the rate that's quoted in there which it's going to depend on who we get as well um, because the rate's going to be commensurate with experience we have five steps on our grid so if we bring someone in with 30 years experience they're not likely on step one um, 
Harvard but, but, can't. This is about a quarter, basically, right? So, yeah. Oh, think of that. Uh, so it's a sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars decision. That fair? Overall. Yes, roughly. Yeah. So annual, in, in terms of annual costs, yeah. That's and that's for the pay, and then there's other costs associated with having an employee in terms of uh, uh, benefits um, and uh, uh, technology and so forth. But yeah, the benefits and stuff are in pensions are included in those numbers. Let's let Barbara speak to that. Yeah, I believe that was the only thing it wouldn't cost is technology, like a, a person needs a cell phone or a computer. So Barbara, do you want to speak to that, what the full cost in a calendar year would be for wages and uh, benefits? Yes. Yeah, so if you're looking at the top uh, rate for that band and including uh, full benefits, uh, and, and that would include pension, you're looking at an annual cost of $65,000. Okay. So that's not the rate of pay, just, <laughs> and uh, this person would be working in house. I don't know that they'd need a work cell phone, uh, likely just be a desk. There is office space here. Um, in the lower level of the office. So they've worked that all out. Uh, and so, all right, it's, it's, it's $65,000 or so. Um, just, uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, certainly improving customer service is, uh, is important, making sure that phone calls get returned and emails responded to and so forth. Uh, um, but it is a big amount of money. And, and, uh, and I wonder, um, you know, how we'll measure success. Um, what specifically will we be able to look back a year from now and say, oh, well, here, here are the metrics that show we're doing better. You know, if we ran a Tim Hortons, we'd, uh, we'd have a measurement of uh, how quickly we serve people. If we're running a retail store, we'd say, well, our sales went up by X number of dollars and that justified this payroll expense. Um, and, um, and so I, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, measuring and uh, having metrics to demonstrate that we're uh, actually achieved improvement. And we don't just feel it, that we actually are keeping score. Um, and uh, so I'm wondering how we'll know a year from now that uh, we got good value for our money here. I, I understand wanting to measure things, and, but there are some things that are not quite tangible to measure and uh, things like employee satisfaction, uh, burnout, workload um, level. So, you know, it isn't just about numbers and productivity when you're in this type of work that we as a municipality do. Sometimes it is about uh, um, other factors that are softer, a little harder to measure. Um, so I don't know if- uh, Well, the, some, of the, some of the concrete measurements are that A, as customer service, um, hopefully you won't get as many complaints that you haven't got a phone call back as, or from a citizen as quickly. Um, internally, hopefully we'll protect ourselves from uh, fines, from provincial orders, from not having health and safety in order in terms of our policies and documentations. There's a lot of things that are in here that there's some things that just aren't being done now, some that we can do a lot better at, and some that are needed to meet the goals that we've established around communications, customer service, even internal customer service with our employees, having things like their vacation schedules and time things like that, getting policies and communications out to them. And, uh, and we could sit down and write a lot of measurements, but I think it'd be really, I, I think you'll know. I, the other thing is ability to retain our senior staff. They're pretty much flying pretty thin right now and they need that admin support. And that's basically the bottom line. Yeah, C uh, Councillor McKechnie is on the personnel committee if you, if you think about it, but also I do see Councillor Clark wanting to ask a question. So I'll go to you, Councillor Clark, first and see. Yeah, more, more of a comment. We've asked Rob's, Rob's department to put more emphasis on roads and, and everything that goes with that. He can't do that without support. If you're going to truly support the idea that roads are important in this township, then you're going to support this position. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor McKechnie, anything you want to add from our personnel committee? <clears throat> no, I, I just agree with Larry, what Larry just said for sure there. We uh, discussed this at great lengths and needless to say, the roads are a huge, huge uh, issue every year and the job's getting bigger and bigger and uh, 
we have to get better at communicating with our constituents and that's one thing, but I think it'll just help the, the whole public works uh, office there and, um, and, and department. And it, I think it's a positive. Okay. I, I, yeah. I understand Councillor Smith, your hesitation too. And believe me, we ask, I ask the very serious questions and that's why sometimes these things take a couple of years to come to, uh, to, to the top, if you will where you know, every time you add a body, every time you add a position here at the township, really, really, really has to be justified that there A is the workload for that. Um, and there's always that fine tipping point between when, um, when somebody, it, oh, sorry, my iPad just went funny there. Um, there is, uh, uh, you don't wanna get it where, that we're, where things are not in a good place. We wanna catch that sweet spot to bring in a staff member when there is plenty of work, but also that the current staff that are there aren't so far uh, extended that they are suffering as well. And that is honestly, I think we're, um, this is a, a, a good hire. And I have asked the question myself, it is a lot of money. Every time you bring in a body into the municipality, it's there, it's full-time job. Um, so I, I understand your hesitation and I, I didn't mean to cut you off or anything if you want to continue to add that, but I have asked those hard questions as well and I do support this hire. Yeah, well, I haven't said I don't support the hire. Oh. Uh, what I ask is how we measure our success. And, um, and so, you know, with, uh, with roads, for example, we can measure uh, the condition of the roads. Uh, and how many roads we improve in a year. We know this year, Rob got over 30 kilometers worth of roads that are being improved. Um, there's something specific there. What I, I'm encouraging, uh, you know, council and staff to think the same way about a position, whatever the position is. This one happy, you know, it, it could be a snowplow operator. Well, we're gonna cover X number of kilometers of roads that we didn't previously do. Well, here's an office position. And the same way, many organizations, in fact, I will say most organizations would look at a position like this and say, all right, what are we gonna measure? What are, where are we today? And where are we gonna to be tomorrow as a result of this position being there? Whether it's employee satisfaction, because we do measure employee satisfaction, whether it's customer satisfaction, whether it's uh, you know, uh, output in terms of uh, social media posts, whatever it is, you know, you've got a, a whole list of things in the job description. And, the only way you can evaluate the employee is how they've delivered. As an organization, we're incurring $65,000 plus of additional cost here. What do we got to show at the end of the year to say, yeah, we know we got value for that. And, um, um, and I'm not here to say what those measurements should be, but there are lots of examples and other organizations do it. And, um, and if and we as the stewards of, uh, of this, uh, uh, organization, um, you know, as a, as a counselor, as a as somebody overseeing it, we ought to be looking for those metrics to assure ourselves that, um, you know, this is uh, working out the way we expected it to work out. Maybe, maybe we need two people in this position. I don't know. But unless we measure it, we'll never know. I, I do think I spoke to a little bit, and I thank you. And I, I, I did speak to a little bit about measuring the things that I, I think are, are maybe harder to measure in, in a number sense, but still measurable. Uh, and also in, in, as a, Tamara mentioned too, like even in the job description, things like the health and safety policies and procedures. And um, so there, there's, there is a lot of things that I think we can take to measure and maybe we can have a report back once if this gets passed and a person is in place uh, and hired and see, and we'll need them and see, you know, what, what they're doing. So, um, Councilor McKechnie, go ahead. Yeah, like um, like the, the personnel committee uh, sounds like you're undermining us. We we, we did like we discussed all these things. What, what what's the job description? Tamara just said what told you, and we're going to be able to project how many phone calls we got. Do you want to know how many phone calls the person's going to answer next year? I don't know. Uh, how how much uh, more uh, work that uh, Rob's going to get done because he's not worrying about. Uh, getting back to on a Monday morning, five or six uh, different uh, incidences that happened on a weekend. We, we can't predict these things. Talk to us in the, uh, six months or a year. 
And um, I'm sure the job, uh, the, the, the person that we hire will, will make the uh, public works department work a lot, run a lot smoother. And that was the whole purpose of it. It's a, it's a big, big department today. It is a lot of a lot of it is requested. And I don't I don't think Councillor Smith's trying to undermine. He's just asking the hard questions. Once you hire a body, believe me, I ask questions too. Once you hire somebody, they're I'm not putting they're not that that becomes part of your annual budget. And so what is the cost to next year's budget? And I do feel I've I've had more time because I'm on the personnel committee and I am the mayor and I'm in close contact with a lot of the department heads in Tamara. So I maybe have some more uh awareness and, and whatnot. And I do feel that this is, uh, this is the right time to be looking to hire this position. So. Well, it just seems to me that uh, we, we can't project how many uh, messages or what exactly how much she's gonna benefit the public works, but we, we're all positive that, that it will. Okay. Okay, so there is a recommendation and the, the recommendation is there. That's the resolution in our package. So um, I will look for a mover and seconder to so Councillor Clark and Councillor Wood Roberts. Be it resolved that council approves the recommendations from the personnel and administration committee to create the position of an administrative assistant for the public works department and direct that this position be placed in band four on a non-union salary grid with a starting date in early September, 2021. All in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. And it's good discussion. It's every time it's, you know, we're being good stewards of our finances and it is a big deal to hire another person. Um, that concludes the open portion of our meeting. I would like to propose uh, that we go into pass resolution to go into close, but then give everyone a 30 minute lunch break. I know that's not that long, uh, but hopefully most of you are at home. I'm here, I brought a little luncheon, so is 30 minutes okay? Is it enough? <laughs> I know some like more. I'd rather keep going quickly and, and get out, get some fresh air at the end of the day. But okay, I see nods, so that's what we'll do. We'll adjourn. I will take the motion to go into closed and read that if I can. Move by uh, Councillor Wood Roberts. And seconded by Councillor Donaldson. We resolve that council adjourn its regular meeting at 12, 12 p.m. to discuss matters pursuant to section 239 of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended pertaining to personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or, or local board employees. And secondly, a trade secret or scientific technical, commercial, financial, or labor relation information supplied in confidence to the municipality or local board which if disclosed could reasonably be expected to prejudice significantly the competitive position or interfere significantly with the contractual or other negotiations of a person, group of persons or organizations. The proposed submissions are from local real estate agencies regarding the wagon wheel subdivision. All in favor? Okay, so we are now enclosed. And so uh, ten after we will reconvene, how about at uh, 1245? So you can just put your screens on, um, yep, turn your screens off. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, so we are back now in open session and I do not have any reports from our closed session today. So I'll look to the floor and see if there's any notice of motion today. Okay, no notice of motion. So uh, just a confirming bylaw to confirm proceedings of today. Move in a seconder, please. Councillor Clark and seconded by Councillor Smith. 
Be it resolved that bylaw number 2021-56 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the regular council meeting held on June 22nd, 2021, you read a first, second, and third time pass sign in the corporate seal attached here too. All in favor? Okay, that's carried. And finally, a motion to adjourn. Councillor Smith is adjourning and Councillor Donaldson. Be it resolved the council adjourn its regular meeting held on June 22nd, 2021 at, I can see the time, 1.54 p.m. All in favor? Okay, that's carried. Take care, everyone. Have a good rest of your day and uh, stay safe. Happy Canada Day is coming up. And a reminder, there's no Committee of the Whole in July. So we'll see you later. Okay, bye now. <laughs>